is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This episode number 715. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources, and joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, PTQs in your future? <laughs> yep. Uh, as I uh, shared with you earlier, I'm actually playing in a PTQ, a sealed PTQ on Sunday to, that qualifies or RCQ, I guess, is actually the, the new name, ah, right. qualifies for the regional championship right here in Denver. So I'm, uh, you know, I can't let a Denver tournament pass by without being qualified. So I'm going to head down and uh, try my luck at sealed. I, you know, on one hand, it feels kind of weird, right? That like a player of your caliber with your career and stuff is like going to be in the PTQ trenches. But on the other hand, I kind of love it. Like, I I do not envy the person who shows up at their local game store for an RCQ and goes to the parents' board and they're paired against LSV. Like, is that for real? Yeah, I mean, that's the new system. I'm not qualified for the regional champs yet. I, I am going to play at the first pro tour is my plan. So, you know, if I do well there, I would end up being qualified, but I'm not going to leave that up to chance. I'm going to try to lock in a qualification now. And, and that would uh, be your, your Hall of Fame invite? Yeah, I get one Hall of Fame invite gotcha. uh, okay. per, per year. All right. Well, are you going to be um, tweeting the the results of the RCQ for everybody? Yeah, I probably. I don't know that I'll do like round by round, but I'll I'll, I'll let, let people us know. know what's going on. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm just curious to follow that because that that just sounds absurd to me. Anyway, good luck with it. Um, this week on the show, we've got the Wilds of Eldr- of Eldrain set review, rare and mythic rare show where we're going to go over every rare mythic row. And then as has become custom, there's a bonus sheet as well. And we will be covering every one of the bonus sheet cards too. So we've got quite a few cards to cover here uh, today, and we're going to be going over each and every one. Before we get into that, though, we did want to just want to take a, a short moment ahead of the show to um, kind of take a moment to remember Sheldon Mennery, who uh, passed away yesterday. And uh, Sheldon was a major, major, major part of the magic community for a very long time. Uh, and in an interesting way, um, Sheldon had the ability to touch so many lives, including mine, by the way. <clears throat> and he somehow was monumental in the competitive scene. He's known for being uh, a level five judge and kind of the leader or one of the main big voices in the room to eliminate cheating from the pro tour back in the early, early days when it wasn't quite seen the same way that it is now where it's, you know, incredibly discouraged back then there was a little more of a shrug attitude about it from some people. And it was kind of like, ah, it's part of the game or something happens, whatever. And, you know, he was one of the big voices in the room that kind of got rid of that. So he had this huge, uh, impact in that way on the pro tour, made it viable, made it long-term, uh, by eliminating that attitude and, and the people who, who did it yet. On the other hand, he somehow had an absolutely bigger, even impact on magic as a whole, you know, in the more casual, like not the hyper competitive space in the sense that he was one of the people who basically invented EDH as it was known or now commander. Um, one of the judges, it started out as a, a judge format that, that judges would play in their downtime at events and such. And he was one of the core group of original people who invented and then popularized EDH. And obviously that's had a huge impact on magic the gathering as a game. It is now the biggest thing in magic. And, uh, and he was uh, on the ground level of that too. So man, how can one person have, you know, had such a huge impact on our game? It's, it's hard to fathom, but, uh, yeah, we wanted to take a minute to, to remember him. Yeah. I mean, when, when I first started playing magic competitively in the early two thousands, what you're saying is true. Like you had to really be on guard because people would try to cheat against you and frequently judges were ill-equipped or too scared or weren't, you know, that just, it wasn't in kind of like the, 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 it wasn't normal custom for judges to really be able to suss out who was cheating and deal with it appropriately. And Sheldon was a big part of that. I mean, not the only one, there's plenty of other judges who get credit for that, but Sheldon really, really made it clear that cheaters weren't welcome and did a good job of kicking them out. I remember, uh, distinctly, you would call a judge when someone did something sketchy against you. And I remember always feeling like, you know what? The judge is not necessarily going to protect me here. Mm-hmm. I did not feel that way when it was Sheldon who answered the judge call or Sheldon who was the head judge of the tournament. Once he was the head judge, you always knew you could appeal to him. And, you know, he did a good job of figuring out what actually was going on and dealing with it. 
And to that, I think the competitive play owes him a huge debt, but also he was just an awesome guy. So he really was. Re- yeah. Really huge part of magic. I mean, one of the top five most influential people on magic as a whole, you know, like you said, in all these different arenas and just by looking at how many people are remembering him right now, he made such a big impact as a person and as a friend and made all these relationships in magic and not many people can have that said about them. And it's awesome when you do so. You know, best wishes to Sheldon, his loved ones, and, you know, everyone else. Yeah, he'll be sorely missed. He was a friend of mine. I did coverage with him. I remember um, the first time I ever did pro tour coverage was in Barcelona. And I was very, I didn't know what I was doing. And they kind of trained me up on the fly. And I was, I don't know, I I guess I was just naive about it and was just kind of like, yeah, I guess we'll see how it goes. Or I, I think I'll do okay or whatever. And then the morning of, like when we were getting ready, I was getting breakfast and we were going to go, um, you know, to actually do the first broadcast, I was like, wow, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I kind of felt a little overwhelmed. And I started to get kind of nervous when I sat down. And I wasn't really eating. And I was just like, wow, like, it was kind of hitting me that like, this was actually going to be happening now. And and I had to like, put all of these things that I had learned in the last few days into action. And that if I didn't do it right, then it would be kind of not great. And I mentioned it to him and, and I didn't know him super well, but I said, yeah, I'm feeling kind of some nerves or something. I'm a little weird. And man, he just had this vibe about him that was like, you're going to be good. And like, you just believed him, you know, you just, he had a very strong personality and very confident. And you just knew that when he said something, you're like, you know what? That guy sounds like <laughs> he knows what he's yep. talking about. And you know what? He made me feel better. He just did. I ate, I ate my breakfast. I went in there and it was fine. And, you know, and that was because of him and, and he didn't hardly know me at all. He didn't have to take the time to, to help me out. He just was built like that. So he will be sorely, sorely missed. And, uh, yeah, we just wanted to to say that. And, and I want to echo what Louis said about, you know, everybody who cared about him, his family, his friends and everything to, uh, you know, get through a tough time after having uh, missed it on Sheldon. So we'll miss you, Sheldon. Thanks for all the great times. Okay, Luis, let's get down to business here for Wilds of Eldraine. The first thing we're going to do um, is go over our grading scale overview because we do have um, to do that. And actually, wait, before I do that, I did want to say thank you to each and every one of our patrons. It's patreon.com slash limited resources. If you'd like to support the show, uh, that is how we are funded. And we really appreciate each and every person who does it. I also want to give a quick thank you to Squirrel Loot. Squirrels here um, behind the scenes, our normal intrepid producer, Jeff. He actually had a, a conflict this week and couldn't make it on the show. Um, but we tapped in Squirrel to come in and help us out with the behind the scenes video production stuff. So thank you, Squirrel, for uh, coming on on such short notice and helping us out. We really appreciate it. Um, Luis, how are we going to do this whole grading scale thing? Walk me through it. All right. So I've never heard this a, before, so I oh, need to never, never, yeah. uh, an A through F grading scale with two subgrades. A's are bombs. These are the game winners, cards that are good in many situations, especially when behind and the best cards in the set. These are a lot of the cards you'll see in mythic and rare get A's. This is where most of the A's live. Of course, these are cards that actively pull you towards their colors so these are card headliners for a set. A lot of the best cards, cards you're pretty happy taking early and playing, they pull you into whatever color or theme that they are. So uh, these are cards like Voracious Hellbeast and Nazgul. Of course, A's are cards like Orcish Bowmasters or Horn of Gondor. Mm-hmm. C's are playables. These are the kind of replaceable pawns of limited cards that you're neither happy nor unhappy to be putting in your deck. They're just cards that go into your deck. Not as many of these rares end up in the C range. Rares tend to cluster on the the highs and the lows, the A's and the F's. Uh, These are cards like Easterling Vanguard or Relentless Rohirrim. These are cards that are sometimes playable. You'd prefer not to run them. And in fact, you feel kind of bad if you do. These are the cards that when your draft ends up a little short, the last couple cards are D's. These are cards like Mortar Trebuchet or Bill Fernie. And then F's are cards that are basically just unplayable. They cost 10 mana. They refer to Planeswalker. They cost all five colors, but don't do even that much. A lot of rares fit into this category. These are cards like Tom Bombadil or Hugh the Entwood. There's two subgrades. One is sideboard, which are cards that you don't put in your main deck, but you will sideboard in. Rares tend not to fall into this category. Rares tend to either be good or bad, not really a sideboard option, but you know, every now and then there is one. And uh, they get a side a grade as if they were a sideboard card. These are cards like Shower of Arrows. Most of the destroy target artifacts style cards end up here. And the last subcategory is one we will see a bunch of. These are build arounds, cards that are not really good enough by themselves, but when you kind of do the work it takes to make them good, they can be awesome. These are cards like Fiery Inscription. What would you give Squirrel? What grade? Uh, 
You better give him an A. He came on like an hour to help us out. Yeah, I think I think squirrels are built around though. You really have to to (laughs) to enable it because otherwise uh, you you end up with uh, you know a kind of unfocused deck. All right, build around A for squirrel loot. Oh man! Uh, All right, so we're going to be starting things off with green, which is where we started the commons and uncommons review. And uh, again, we're going to go through each of the main colors, then the gold and colorless, and then we will do the bonus sheet as well. So first green card up is called Bramble Familiar. It is one and a green for a 2-2 elemental raccoon at rare. It taps for green, or you can pay one and a green, tap it, and discard a card to return Bramble Familiar uh, to its owner's hand. So you can bounce it. But it also, and this is kind of the, the trick, it is a adventure, and it has... Fetch quest, which is five green green for a sorcery, seven mana sorcery, mill seven cards, then put a creature, enchantment, or land card, <clears throat> excuse me, from among the milled cards onto the battlefield. So what's so, the play pattern here? So this is one of the odd adventure cards that has the adventure as more expensive than the creature, because the normal play pattern for adventures is cast the adventure spell and later cast the creature, right? For Bramble Familiar... They put that clause in of one and a green and tap, discard a card to bounce it. That makes the card a lot more interesting because you're going to put this card in your deck and just cast it on turn two if it's in your opening hand. It's a two mana two two that taps for a green. Great card. You would you would always yeah. play it. That's almost a B by itself, actually. I think it is just a B. Mm. Just two mana two two that taps for a green is a B. It's a good accelerant that has a actual real you know stats to to brawl. And then later in the game. At some point, you're just going to go, all right, end of your turn, I'll discard a land, return this to my hand, pay seven, mill seven, and then put a good creature into play, hopefully. And at that point, you then recast Bramble Familiar. And if the game goes on, you could actually do it again. Though milling seven, you can't do that probably more than twice. You can right. maybe do it do it only once, depending on the length of the game. <laughs> you, it might surprise you, but I've uh, uh, almost decked myself or successfully decked myself multiple times in this <laughs> format. So... I think Bramble Familiar is an awesome card. It's got a really natural play pattern. You don't really have to choose between the two. You'll just go ahead and cast the 2-2 and then later cast the 7 mana spell. The only time you really have to make a choice is you draw Bramble Familiar on 5 or 6 mana. And then you're like, well, you know, should I just wait and cast it on 7? Most of the time you should just put it into play as a 2-2. But every now and then you'll make the other choice. Yeah. You know, you can do this at instant speed, right? The return to your hand thing. Mm Mm-hmm. Because because one of the play patterns that I was thinking of is you play it out and maybe you played in the middle part of the game, you know, you got five mana or something and you play it. If your opponent does see, all right, well, the, I, I see where this is going. You're going to end up get, getting to cast fetch quest and I'm just going to kill the Bramble Familiar and, and take it out of commission uh, before, you know, the turn before you get enough mana to do it or something in that range. But even then, I mean, you know, if they're using their removal spell on your, your two, two for two or whatever, it's probably fine. You've only put two mana into it and it's benefited you in the meantime. Card seems really cool. Um, you know, I think the I agree with you about it being basically a B or a B minus somewhere in that range for one in a green two two that taps for G. The question is, like, how much do we care about fetch quest? It it does not generate card advantage. It just gets you the best thing out of the seven milled cards. But you know, it is creature. It can hit enchantment, so you can hit that if you have it. And you can also hit a land, although I have a hard time thinking that, that you'd want to do that. Um, does it get up to B plus? Yeah, I think it does. Okay. A two mana two two that has significant late game upside. That yeah. sounds like a B plus to B+. me. B plus. Elvish Archivist is next. It's one and a green for a zero one elf artificer. This one's also rare. It says whenever one or more artifacts enter the battlefield under your control, put two plus one plus one counters on Elvish Archivist. This ability only triggers once each turn. And whenever one or more enchantments enter the battlefield under your control, draw a card. And this also uh, only triggers once each turn. This card's really cool. It works with food tokens. It works with rolls. It works naturally with cards just like Prophetic Prism or Soul Guide Lantern. And I, you know, I drafted this card. My, my deck ended up terrible. It's not a reflection of Elvish Archivist. But during the draft, I just noticed how many cards enabled this or, or worked with this. And it's you don't actually have to go that far out of your way. I wouldn't even call this a build around. Because okay. y- y- yeah, you do need to make sure you have a combination of these two, though if you had to choose one, just having enchantments and having this be a card draw machine is great. But honestly, if you if you did a normal draft and at the end of the draft, it's like, hey, do you want to add an Elvish Archivist to your deck? You're playing green. You would just say yes most of the time because mm-hmm. 
most of your decks are going to have 10 things that interact with this one way or another. It's like, oh, you know, my Sweet Tooth Witch or my, uh, you know, card that makes rolls or my Prophetic Prism. All that stuff just works out nicely. Oh, this Saga is an enchantment, you know, like it's just all so easy. So I would actually give Elvish Archivist an A-. minus. I think it's a card that your opponent's going to have to kill almost every time or they're going to end up in trouble. Yeah, and, and you know, thinking about that first triggered ability, I, you only need it to go once, right? You get two counters, it becomes a two, three that you only put two, two man into. And it's, that's totally, you know, anything beyond that starts getting really good. But right there, you're already, you know, ahead on your mana and you still have this card draw engine potentially. And like you said, you know, food tokens, treasure tokens, like those things just get thrown around nicely. So yeah, I like it. That card seems awesome. This is the one toughness, is the window for the one toughness a concern for you? Yeah, I mean, it is it is a bit of a liability, and this is one of the cards you should consider not just playing on turn two. You just have to look at your curve. If your curve is such where you have a different two drop and you're not going to be archiving on uh, turn two or turn three, rather, you maybe want to save it so you can go turn four, play this plus prism in the same turn just to be a little safer. But okay. it really is just going to depend on kind of what your draw looks like and you said a minus you like for elvish archivist i like a minus yeah i mean it, maybe you open this pack three it's not like in your deck isn't set up to really uh take full advantage of it but for the most part if i would just take this early if it was a close to an a level card it's funny because it, it's it's a build around but almost in the reverse sense like you just need to make sure that your card that your deck has that stuff normally it's like you have to draft towards it but here you're gonna get the the enchantments and artifacts by default you just need to double check that you didn't get a weird deck that doesn't have them next is feral encounter this is green green for a sorcery at rare it says look at the top five cards of your library you may exile a creature card from among them put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order you may cast the exile card this turn at the beginning of the next combat phase this turn target creature you control deals damage equal to its power up to one target creature you don't control yeah this okay. this te this templating is just God, really it's, horrific. It's it's really <laughs> hard to. It's just it feels like a, a ingredient list. It's like thing 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 thing, but it doesn't really flow together. Okay, so look at the top five. You can exile can a creature. What the card does. Yeah, can you do that? It's green green, and at the start of your next combat, one of your creatures bites theirs. Okay, that that's the baseline. Okay, you also get to look at the top five cards of your deck, exile a creature, and then play it this turn only. Okay. And you have to cast it. You have to pay for it. You have to cast it, yeah. Yep. So it's basically a fight spell with upside. And sometimes you're going to end up in a position where you get to use the upside. And sometimes you're not. So we're adding green green to whatever the thing that we uh, reveal is. Yeah. So that's kind of the downside is like, if you, like, for example, if you play this on turn four. You can only you, play a two mana creature. You can only play a two mana creature. Now that two mana creature can be the thing that bites though, right? If you do it before combat. Uh, yeah. Yes. You could, you, you like, let's say you were, uh, sitting there, you top deck this, you have no creatures in play. You can just cast this, hope to hit a creature to fight. That's obviously a bit of a desperation maneuver, but you might, you might end up doing that sometimes. Yeah. I like this though. I mean, I, you, you, you all the things you said, I didn't dislike any of them. I like bite. I oh. like only two mana and I like getting extra cards out of it. I mean, it's a, it's effectively just a bite spell for, for green, green. Cause look at doing it at the start of combat is just not that, uh, awkward of timing. Cause you still no. get to attack, you know, it's still kind of does the thing you want to do. Yes, you can't do it post-combat. You know, this card does nothing if you cast it post-combat, except actually, I guess, search for a creature. But yeah, but just think about it as a rabid bite that sometimes draws you a card. Yeah, it's I mean... To totally fine. Yeah, the upside on this is just a two-for-one, and it's a really good two-for-one. Like, it kills something that's on the board and gives you a creature, potentially. So, mana intensive, yes, but yeah, I like it. I, I would say... Uh, at least a B. I don't know if it gets to B plus. It, I guess it depends on how often you actually get to cast the creature. Because this is, I would wait basically as long as I could to cast Feral Encounter mana wise. Yeah, I'd want is, at least five, you know. Th this is a card that rewards you for waiting. It should be your last card cast in a lot of cases. But it's, I think, I think it's like a B. I yeah. think, or maybe, maybe even B plus. It's like trending it's, towards B plus more than B minus. That's for sure. Yeah. Okay. B plus for Feral Encounter. 
Uh, next is Mosswood Dread Knight. This is one in a green for a 3-2 human knight with trample. And when it dies, you may cast it from your graveyard as an adventure until the end of your next turn, which it does have an adventure called Dread Whispers, which is off color. It's one in a black. It's a sorcery. And it says you draw a card and you lose one life. So can I do Dread Whispers, then Mosswood, and then it dies and then do Dread Whispers again? Yeah, so you cast Dread Whispers, then you cast the Mosswood, and then when it dies, you have until your, the end of your next turn to recast it. Dang. Which is pretty awesome. So that's a three for one? Yeah, I mean, it's it's actually unbounded because it just keeps happening. <laughs> oh, so so when you when you adventure it from your graveyard, it's on an adventure and then you can just get it again? Yeah, so you, you adventure Dude, it and then what you recast the... it. And you have until the end of your next turn. So like, even if I attack with it and am tapped out this turn, I can still just come to my turn, untap, and then just uh, adventure it and then even cast it again for four mana. That's insane. Yeah. I mean, this card's really cool. Like it would, it would be awesome if it was a two mana, three, two trample that had the adventure of draw card, lose a life. And the fact that it just kind of keeps going and going and going is, is great. The, oh, so basically, if they kill it on their turn, you have until the end of your next turn to cast Dread Whispers, and you don't even have to cast the Moss with Dread Knight. Right. Once it's in the Adventure Zone, you can just chill and it's reset. And if if you attack and it dies, you just have to make sure to have two mana to cast uh, Dread Whispers afterwards. Obviously, it's it's good if you can like sacrifice it for value for something. And overall, I mean, there's just nothing to dislike about this card. It's also a two mana, three, two trample. Yeah, I mean, which that's already great. Right, it picks up the rolls really well. Dude, this card's insane. Yeah, it, it is really sweet. The only downside, or not downside, the only thing this thing doesn't do is this isn't like a bomb level card in terms of the effect it has on a game. Like, this isn't a 5-5 five, five flyer. This won't mm. beat them when they play a gruff triplet. Well, that's one of the best cards in the set. But it it won't have this like massive effect on the game. It's a grindy value card. There's going to be games where you could have access to any number of two mana three twos and it wouldn't beat your opponent's, you know, four, four flyer plus three, three flyer that they're attacking you with. Right. That's true. So I do think this card is, is like an A minus though. I do too. Imagine that you're, you're, you're sitting there and you're, and you've got two removal spells and a normal curve and your opponent just plays this on turn two totally. and you're like, damn. Yeah. I'm not beating this thing. And, and they can just throw it away to anything. They can bargain it away and then just, Dread Whispers again, and every time they do, yeah, they're losing a life, but their hand is getting filled up. I like A- minus for Mosswood Dread Knight. That card's, that, that's the type of card that makes you really go, how many exile effects do I have in this deck? Torch the Tower is the perfect answer to this, by Good the way. Lord. Uh, Questing Druid is next. This is one and a green for a 1-1 one, one human druid at rare. Whenever you cast a spell that's white, blue, black, or red, put a plus one, plus one counter on Questing Druid. And then it is also an adventure creature. It has Seek the Beast, which is one in a red, <laughs> so another off color. This is an instant. Exile the top two cards of your library until your next end step. You may play those cards. Okay. So mm -hmm. it's basically a Kirin Dryad, an old card, which yep. is the, the two mana one one part that grows whenever you cast, basically, whenever you cast a non green, non artifact spell, whenever you cast. Uh, you know, any anything that's on your second color or third color. And it also has this weird reckless impulse, though. Again, this is until your next end step, which means because most of the time you're going to cast it on your turn, you have an, this turn to cast it. Yeah, like, but it, it is it, an instant, so you can end step it yeah, but to get, not make that, sure your mana is there, right? Yeah, there, there's not that many times that you would want to do that as opposed to, depending on how much mana you have, you, you kind of want it right away a lot of the time. But the fact that it's instant adds extra flexibility. Yeah, so, well, I mean, wouldn't it be common, though, for you to end step Seek the Beast? Yeah, no, that is true. I, yeah. I guess that you, you I, I've played with this card and I've mostly been sorcery speeding it, but that also depends on kind of what, how much mana you have. Well, you've got a lot to learn, so. Yeah, true enough. True <laughs> enough. I am PTQing after all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how was it though? Like, how many? I've I guess the question twice, is actually. how many uh, counters do you need before the just questing druid side of it is fine? Just the one. Discard any red green deck that can just reliably cast both halves. It's like a B plus. It's a good okay. card. Yeah. You're, you're you're gonna frequently end up with a three three or four four after some number of turns and seek the beast 
pretty frequently is going to draw you at least one card. Yeah, like at least one. Two. And it is play. So yeah, you, you can, can play lands. Play lands. Yeah. So that seems really strong to me, actually. Again, you mentioned it, though. This is a effectively a gold card, right? A, a red, green, gold card. So I, the question would not, becomes, would you play Questing Druid if you couldn't cast Seek the Beast in a 50-50 green, black deck or something? I would not want to do that. Because then, then you would need to reliably cast two spells to get a 3-3, three, three, which sometimes you're even waiting a turn or two for. Mm-hmm. That's not great. And I certainly and you, wouldn't and you cast also this if don't I could s- only cast the red part. <laughs> right. And and it's also worth noting that Questing Druid, you know, in order to get those, sp- it does need to be kind of in your opening hand, and then you cast two off-color spell. If you draw it later, you're not doing that. So setup cost yeah. is very legit. Okay, so what would you give it in red-green? B plus? B plus, Okay. Yeah. And then outside of it, you're kind of not playing it unless you can get access to the red-green. I played it in a green black deck that that was also playing like a couple ways to make red mana off like prophetic prism or the scarecrow guide. Uh-huh. So in that situation, it's it's like closer to a B, but it's okay. still fine there. But that that's part of what I've been doing in this format is playing a lot of off color adventures. So th- a lot of these you're going to kind of dip your toe into another color off of these five color fixers. Okay. Uh, next is Sentinel of Lost Lore. It's one green green for a three four elf knight at rare. When it enters the battlefield, choose one or more. There's three options. First one is return target card you own in exile that has an adventure to your hand. Uh, or you can, and or, you can put target card you don't own in exile that has an adventure on the bottom of its owner's library. That's rude. Um, and or you can exile target player's graveyard. So you get a three mana three four, which is already you know, well above curve. Yeah. And then you get really relevant stuff. What do you make of the first ability return to our cone? So basically take a card you have adventured and then get it back in your hand so that you can re-adventure and then, you know, cast the creature ostensibly. Yeah, it's okay. It's not that good. Mm -hmm. Like part the thing is adventures are a little bit clunky. So most of the time you're not going to be like, I'm going to adventure this spell. Then I'm going to play this to get it back. And then I'm going to adventure it again. Then I'm going to want to play the creature. Like, you will do that. It's better to do that than not. It's it's basically strictly better to have an adventure in your hand as opposed to in the adventure zone because now you can just, again, recast the adventure. But most of the time, you're not going to have an, a bunch of adventures that you're super stoked to do that with. Like, you know, you it's going to be okay, but it's not going to be – it's going to be a lot worse than draw a card. Like yeah. way worse than just draw a card. Yeah, it's Just, somewhere between a quarter and a half of a card. <laughs> and yeah. now what about taking their creature that was going to come off of an adventure that had already been cast and become a creature and instead it's gone? That one I like quite a bit more yeah. because that one uh, gets to nug one of their pretty solid creatures. Again, you're you're not getting a whole card out of it because they cast the adventure part, but I don't know, you put a 6-5, you know, Baluna's Gatekeeper back or Gingerbread Giant or wh- whatever it is, Gingerbread Hunter. Like, there's a lot that you can do that you would feel pretty good about. And you're getting this on a 3-mana three 3-4, three, which does cost green, green 1. Like, yeah. I wouldn't put 1 green, green, 3-4, no text into my deck. I just don't think that's a good card. Okay. But just because the, the the casting cost means that you're not always going to cast it on curve, it's a lot worse than 2 and a green in limited. But, I, you know, add those two plus... Exiling their graveyard, it does not nothing. When I mean, it's good, it's good, and it, there's almost no downside, right? Yeah, I mean, you 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 should just do it. There's, yeah. there, I don't think there's any reason not to do it because no. them having their cards in their graveyard is better than them having them in exile, right? And there is this isn't a heavily graveyarded theme, as you can see from the first two things. You know, it's a little more on the adventure exile thing, but still, card all all told, though, seems good. It's a solid body for the for the price, and you get you know, a fraction of a card away from them and potentially a fraction of a card towards you. And then you just get a free roll, their graveyard going away. That could be worth something. Yeah. I would say this this is is a a B minus. Like a B minus for Sentinel of Lost Lore. Just put it in your green decks. It it has synergy with adventures. So yeah, you're going to want to, you know, combine it with adventures, but I don't think that's even like the the biggest thing to to worry about. Like I would just put it in my deck mostly. And when you do hit, uh, the mana on time. That's nice. I mean, that's going to be the biggest thing at three mana. Uh, next is the Huntsman's Redemption. This is two and a green for a saga at rare. And uh, chapter one is you get a three, three beast token. Chapter two is you may sacrifice a creature. If you do search your library for a creature or basic land card, reveal it, put it in your hand and then shuffle. 
In chapter three is up to two target creatures each get plus two plus two and trample until end of turn. You know, when when the baseline is three mana three three beast, it's kind of hard for them to screw up the next two chapters. And, uh, you know, they can be quite minimal and I still would be fine with the card. And these are actually okay. Like sacrificing a, a random other, probably not the three three beast ideally, but, you know, some other token of rat or something. And going to search up your best creature or the most relevant creature for that time in the game is pretty good option. It is also a may ability, so you can just say, I'm good. And then yep. the last one is like kind of a lot, right? It's plus two, plus two on two different things in Trample as well. Yeah, I mean, the last one is a nice little mini overrun. This is all coming on basically two and a green for a three, three with massive upside. Right. I love it. So uh, Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm in for Huntsman's Redemption. It, it's good. It, it's not a bomb. I would think it's a B, but yeah, it, there's there's games where it's really going to perform. So we, we that, often uh, talk about ceilings and floors for cards, and while this one has a reasonable ceiling, it has a very high floor, and and it gives you the thing that you want when you want it. Turn three, 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 so you can block, attack, you know, get your brawl on. Next is Blossoming Tortoise. This is two GG for a three three turtle. This is a mythic rare. Whenever Blossoming Tortoise uh, enters a battlefield or attacks, mill three cards, then return a land card from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Activated ability of lands you control costs one less to activate, and land creatures you control get plus one, plus one. Dang, that's kind of a lot. Yeah, I mean, it. it is a lot of text, but <laughs> I don't think it's, I don't think it's mostly relevant for limited. No, you're not. You act so? You're not activating lands. And no, the the last two abilities aren't really a thing. Yeah, but if you play a four mana three three, you know I don't know what the odds are that you actually hit a land out of milling three, but I assume they're pretty high. Probably in the seventy five, yeah, 60, something 70% like that. percent range, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So you know, if, if if you play your four drop three three and it gets you a land onto the battlefield, that's pretty strong. And then anytime you attack, you have more shots to get more lands, though <laughs> you do start to mill yourself pretty quickly. Yeah, it, it, it is not optional. <laughs> right. And it's worth noting that, you know, by the time you cast this, you're likely at 29 cards in your library. So the three is, you know, coming up on a pretty good chunk of your total library each time. And of course, getting worse and worse as you go. It is also two GG for just a three, three, like body wise, that is definitely understated. I don't know. How much do you value, you know, wh what if it was 2GG, 3-3, three, three, you know, get a basic and put it on the battlefield tapped? I think that'd be pretty good. Like, yeah. I would, I would, and this I would is be pretty worse than that, that card. right? I think it is worse than that, yeah. Yeah. Even though you have the ability to get more of them as you attack? Yeah. I. Well, is it worse than that? Let's say you play it, you get a thing. Well, I was yeah. saying if it was just 2GG, 3-3, three, three, ETB, go get a land tapped. No, I know. I'm saying like okay. it, the fact that you can get two lands out, out of this is pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Like that, that, is, that is fairly relevant, I would say. Yeah. The fact that it's not a May is a little awkward. I don't know. What do you want to give the Blossoming Tortoise? I, I guess I wouldn't cut this card, especially if you can draft some graveyard synergies. It's not really so much like I'm putting... Uh, land land combos in my deck it's more like i'm gonna i'm gonna just put some raised dead type cards in my deck and like <laughs> this will this will enable them yeah overall i would say blossoming tortoise is probably like a c like c plus c plus know. yeah there is upside here i mean adventures and stuff you usually have a lot to do with your mana and so getting more of it on a creature is already pretty good C, C plus for blossoming tortoise i it feels like it would be very good right up until the point where it was very very bad um Next is, oh, you just mentioned it, Gruff Triplets. What does Gruff Triplets do? It's three green, green, green. So six mana for a 3-3 three, three Trample. When it enters the battlefield, if there, if it isn't a token, create two tokens that are copies of it. So you end up with three of these. And then whenever it dies, put a number of plus one, plus one counters on it equal to its power on each creature you control named Gruff Triplets. Okay. So basically, you play this, and when the first one dies... It puts three plus one plus one counters on the other two, so you have a six, two six sixes. With and when one of those one of those dies, it puts six counters on the last one, so you have a twelve twelve. So it goes three six twelve, 
and all also with just, trample. <laughs> all with trample. Also, it's just six mana for three three threes. I, I mean, this card is obviously a little tricky to cast, but it's just like unbeatable if you if you if you cast it pretty much. And, and it's a regular rare, like. I, I, well, I guess I say that though. I did beat it the one time my opponent cast it on me. I just killed all three because I was so far ahead. But that's wow. not going to be like the that's, normal case. That's rare, and yeah, it just gets worse and worse for you. Okay. Well, that looks like an A. Uh, the only gripe would be the triple green and the mana cost, so you have to just accommodate that. But it seems well worth it. I would say this is an A plus. I mean, if this isn't sure. an A plus, I don't really know what is. Like sure. it's. It's a six mana rare that puts three creatures into play. So if you're behind, it's great. It's good against removal. The only thing it's bad against is counter spells. Also, I guess if you bounce the tokens, they don't get the counters on everything. But like, that's still not the you know end of the world. But you're getting nine power of trample for six mana <laughs> across three creatures that they can't really just pick off. That's just crazy. All right, AA plus for Gruff Triplets. Next is Virtue of Strength. This is five green green for an enchantment at Mythic Rare. Uh, and it says, if you tap a basic land for mana, it produces three times as much of that mana instead. Nothing like the uh, seven mana ramp spell, um, but it does have an adventure. It's called Garenbrig Growth. It is green for a sorcery. And it says, return target creature or land card from your graveyard to your hand. So that's kind of where so, the focus is here, right? Because virtue yeah, strength is like what, kind of nothing. It's a zero. It's a straight right. up F. Right. So the question is, would you pay one green to get a creature or land from your graveyard to your hand? I'm not really that excited about that. No, like, but you're you not would. Raised edding, you're not raised deading a land very often. Mm -hmm. And we we do better now. Like compare this to the 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 fell knight, the one in a black, right. get a creature back and you have a three three on the other side. Like that's just better than this, I think. Yes, definitely. So, it, and virtue of strength really is just not even a thing. Yeah, I would say this is a D. D. Like it. D for Garenbrig growth. <laughs> it's kind of what it comes down to. Yeah. Uh, last green card is Thunderous Debut. This is six green green. So we're up to the eight mana slot now. They skip five. They went four, six, seven, eight. <laughs> <laughs> this is a sorcery at rare. It's got bargain. And that just as a quick reminder means you can sack an artifact enchantment or token as you cast a spell to get a benefit. So this says, look at the top... <clears throat> 20 cards of your library <laughs> yeah. you may reveal up to two creature cards from among them if this spell was bargained put the revealed cards onto the battlefield otherwise put the revealed cards in your hand then shuffle by the time you can cast this you're going to be able to bargain it bargaining has been pretty trivial in this set so far there's Definitely. so much that enables it so the question is do you want to pay eight mana to basically look at your rest of your entire deck and put the best two creatures into play I don't think that's very good. No. Like, it does nothing before eight mana. And also, what if you just don't have two great creatures left? Like, you right. need to have some good ones. And if you have a ton of good creatures, great. Just cast those and win the game. Like, I, I don't think that this is much of a limited card. I could see siding this in if, like, you're playing a green deck with a bunch of ramp and a bunch of high-quality creatures. You have a gruff triplets. You have everything. And you're playing against another deck that's also kind of slow. and You just want more haymakers. But I wouldn't even give it a sideboard grade. I'd say this is a D. Like, it's D closer to F than anything else. Yeah, D, build around D for a super ramp deck with lots of big targets maybe. But 8 mana kind of just takes it out of contention. Okay, let's move on to white, where our first card up is called A Tale for the Ages. This is one and a white for an enchantment at rare. Enchanted creatures you control get plus two, plus two. This card's really cool. I, I got to take this in the uh, pre-release event, uh, the, the the streamer event, and build around it. I picked one did, and it actually worked. I mean, it's okay. It's a build around, so but it's I think it's a build around A. Like you just need to draft a bunch of rolls or cards that grant rolls, and this is pretty close to your creatures having plus two plus two, which is a fantastic. Card. That's like, a bomb, yeah. Takes some work, but I think Tail for the Ages is a build around A. Okay, build around A, and you just need to pay attention to all of the ores, rolls, and such. Next is Heart Flame Duelist. This is one in a white for a 3-1 human knight. It's rare. Instant and sorcery spells you control have lifelink. So this means that your burn spells, if they hit something, will you'll gain that much life. And this also is one. Uh, it is Heart Flame Slash as its adventure. It's an instant for two and a red. And note that is red, not white. Uh, Heart Flame Slash deals three damage to any target. Yeah, Heart Flame Duelist is awesome. Fantastic card. 
You don't even need to do any sort of comboing, though. If you are playing red-white and playing both halves, sometimes you will cast one of your other spells and gain, you know, two to four life or whatever, which is great. But think about this as just a a five mana three one that deals three when it comes into play, but except you can split it up and cast half of it at instant speed and you can only cast the three one if you're stuck on mana. I would give Heartflame Duelist an A minus. It's just a great card. And I would also super sick happily two for one. play it if I could only play the red half. Yeah, th- this would be the really good common burn spell, right? The, the, yeah. the, the lightning bolt to the set, if you will. But now you just get a random one in a white three one whenever you want or after the fact artwork sick too like this one really just kind of hits hits it all um if you were just in white it's like what a d plus or a c minus or something just two mana three one it's like a c minus it's a two mana three one and uh part of the problem with it is if you're just in white and you're not playing the red part you're certainly not getting anything out of that text because you're not gonna have any damaging spells that's right but if you were only in red you would play this right you said that you would just you'd put in your deck even if you couldn't cast the duelist itself all right next is pollen shield hair this is one in a white for a two two rabbit it is rare it says creature tokens you control get plus one plus one. It's also got an adventure. This time it's green. It's called hair raising. It is green for a sorcery. This is a target creature you control gets vigilance, uh, gains vigilance and gets plus X plus X until end of turn where X is the number of creatures you control. Yeah. It's a cool card because the two mana two, two version is pretty strong. If you can combine it with a bunch of rats, mostly though, there are some like cards that make mice like there's that saga, the rare one. Um, and if you are green, white, you can also use it as kind of an aggressive card. Like you get to, you get to cast the, the green half and give one of your creatures like a just giant bonus. So again, the question becomes like, if you split this one up. So this, this one is interesting. If I was green, white, I would pretty much always play this because two mana, two, two with a slight bonus stapled to a green spell that could sometimes deal an extra five damage or whatever. That sounds great. And I would also play this if I was black, white or red, white and had a bunch of cards that made rats. Cause then, then it buffs your rats. So okay. it's a kind of, it's a kind of weird card where it's like, it is split into two cards, but there's the green, white card, which is playable in green, white decks. Then there's the white half, which is playable in token decks. Mm-hmm. The green part is not playable by itself, but don't right. do that. Uh, what grade do you want to give Paul and shield here? Overall, it's probably like a B minus. Like yeah. it's it's solid, but this isn't good enough to like take early and build around. And in, in, in my experience, it's just a card that can slot into your deck um, if it's in there if it's in the right place. Next is Regal Bunnycorn. <laughs> this is a one and a white for a star star rabbit unicorn at rare. Regal Bunnycorn Bunnycorn's power and toughness are each equal to the number of non land permanence you control this card's great that's interesting it counts itself so it's a two mana one one but for any permanent you have that isn't a land it just gets bigger like the average board it's going to make it a four four yeah you know but by the middle of the game and sometimes it'll be a seven seven and like yeah look on you play it on turn two then you play a creature on turn three it's just a two two but there's all these things that make food there's just like all these ways to make this bigger it counts rolls as well so like This thing's frequently going to be a 5-5, five, five, I think, but the bunny corn's a B plus. Just okay. play, play it in a creature heavy deck, look for rolls, just try to try to maximize it. But you don't even have to like go all the way. Like you don't have to do too much to make this card good. And with a little work, you can make it great. Yeah. And you know, these play out really well because you'll play them on two and they're small, but by the time like pre-combat, you know, you play out a thing with a roll or whatever, and now it's too bigger and it has an attack that your opponent maybe wasn't able to to deal with and then you get to do that again the next turn it really kind of scales nicely with the game the biggest uh, thing to worry about with regal <laughs> bunnycorn is if your opponent has instant speed interaction they they can mess you up pretty bad like they can shrink it imagine they they kill or bounce one of your other things then this shrinks or whatever right like they kill something that has a roll on it and now it's too smaller yeah so be yeah. careful but but yeah that thing can be huge for only two mana next is spellbook vendor this is one in a white for a two two human peasant at rare it's got vigilance and it says at the beginning of combat on your turn you may pay one when you do create a sorcerer roll token attached to our creature you control and uh that is the plus one plus one and whenever this creature attacks you scry one roll 
Nice. I mean, this this card is absurdly good. Yeah, that's awesome. Like, it can target itself, first of all, unlike mm. the, you know, like the blue 2-4 on common can't, can't target itself. Mm -hmm. This one this one targets itself. So oh. by itself, <laughs> this is one and a white for a 2-2 two, two Vigilance that just immediately you pay one on the same turn if you have the mana, and now it's a 3-3. Three, three. And, and every turn it's just giving a roll to one of your creatures. Like, Spreading yeah, Spellbook, ben Spellbook Bender is great. Uh, I, I would say this isn't hey. Like, okay. if this is in play, your opponent has to deal with it. Yeah. It's going to be good early and good late. Do you wait till turn three to play it? Well, yeah. I mean, ideally, you play a different creature on turn two than play this on turn three and, and give it the, the roll to the other creature. But if I had no other no other two drops, I would just play this on turn two. The thing is, if they kill it, they kill it. Like, there's yeah. not that much you can do about it. Like... Unless your hand is one that like really needs the rolls to to function, in which case I would I would try to slow roll it. But spellbook vendor, it just takes no work. It asks you to have creatures. That's it. Yeah. A for spellbook vendor. Next is three blind mice. This is two and a white for a saga at rare. Chapter one is create a one one white mouse creature token. Chapter two and chapter three are the same. You create a token that's a copy of target token you control. So at least you get two more mice, assuming that the, the original mouse is still there. And then there is a chapter four, creatures you control get plus one, plus one, and gain vigilance until on turn. Great card. By itself, it makes three mice and it lets you attack for six with them. But there is a lot you can do to, to kind of maximize it. If... You know, if you want to make tokens of like food, you can like if you're in a, in a tough spot. Uh, it also obviously works pretty well if you're going wide with other creatures. And, you know, the last part of the saga is really good. And just by itself, three mana for three creatures is really good, even if it takes a little while. The biggest downside is if you have no other tokens and you cast this like on turn three, for example, if your opponent just then fires off a removal spell at your mouse, you, you might be stuck where the next two turns do nothing. Right. One thing that can happen is you might give up chapter two, but then if you cast a, something that gives you a token, then chapter three can copy the token. It also yeah. doesn't care if it's a creature, right? Like if you just happen to yeah. have a food, you could just get an extra food or get something totally. out of it. Yeah. So be careful with it. But yeah, I mean, the, the value is here for sure. And, you know, it is interesting because, you know, chapter two and three don't care what token it is. They can copy whatever. And chapter four doesn't care if they're token creatures. It just says creatures yeah. you control. So, you know, there is a lot to be gained here, um, but it is risky. If it, it, it is really crappy. If you play it on turn three, they kill your mouse and then you just don't do anything. Like you might give one random creature plus one, plus one in vigilance or something. So you do have to be careful. What do you want to give it? B? I'd give a, a, I'd probably give it an A minus. Like really, this is a pretty, a pretty scary card. If 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 your opponent goes two drop into this on turn three, if you can't kill the mouse, you're probably going to lose on the on the fourth chapter. You're getting attacked for like twelve damage. Yeah, and and it by itself it 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 puts a little army in a can out. If your opponent does have removal for it, then yeah, I mean you might end up in a spot where it doesn't do as much, but you're still trading one for one for three mana, still getting the overrun, and you often will get another token out of it. I've just found the card to be pretty effective in both fast and slow games. So okay. All right, well, you talked me up to, to B plus on three blind mice then. See how they Fair run. Fair enough. Where Fox Bodyguard is next. It is one white white for a 2-2 two, two elf fox knight at rare. It's got flash, and it says when it enters the battlefield, exile up to one other target non-fox creature until where <laughs> Fox Bodyguard leaves the battlefield. That's nasty. And then you can pay one and a white and sacrifice it to gain two life. So... Jeez. You can you can do this to your creature or theirs. That's the bodyguard part. And that's also why it has the sack call clause because they want you to be able to sack it. And let's say you play this to save your good creature. You can then, whenever you want, kind of pull the trigger and just, you know, sack the werefox, gain two life, you get your creature back. But most of the time, I think you're just going to exile their creature. Yeah, this like is that, three that, mana that, instant speed way to just nab their creature. Yeah, it's an instant speed banisher priest. Which, wow, which is and awesome. it hits tokens too? Yep. So the Jeez. way the wording works is if you target their token and they kill this in response, the token never leaves place, so they get to keep it. But yeah, if you ever exile a token, the token's gone. Like, that's it. Wow. This card's awesome. 
Yeah, I would give this one an A minus as well. Yeah, it's just same. a really strong value card. Uh, really good if you can uh, play some raised deads. Like this is the kind of creature that makes me want to, you know, put a fell horseman in my deck, that sort of thing. Right, man, and you get a body out of it too. That, yeah, that's really impressive. Uh, next is Archon of the Wild Rose. This is two white white for a four four Archon. It's rare. It's got flying, and other creatures you control that are enchanted by auras you control have base power and toughness. Four, four, and have flying. Whoa. You get a so, four man, a four, four flyer. And if you have just like some random thing with a roll on it, it's all of a sudden a four, four flyer with the roll on it. Yeah. So probably a five, five. <laughs> I, I, I've lost badly to this card twice so far. It, it's just, it, it plays as a four man, a four, four flying that immediately lets you probably attack for five with one of your creatures. Right. And so then even when they kill it on their turn, you still took that big hit. And if they can't kill it, of course, you, you lose. The A for Archon of Wild Rose. Yeah. Yeah, you do want to put rolls in your deck if you have this. You can obviously just play it even without any. But as we said before, you will naturally have a couple of those effects in most decks. Crazy. Uh, next is Expel the Interlopers. This is three white white for a sorcery at rare. Uh, choose a number between zero and ten. Destroy all creatures with power greater than or equal to the chosen number. Interesting. So this is... A a wrath with upside because if your creatures are smaller than theirs, you can choose – like let's say you have all one ones and they have all twos and above. You just choose uh, two and then, it, and then it destroys all theirs and none of yours or, or some combination thereof. And also just three white, white wrath I think is a pretty good card. This format is fast, which – you know, makes five mana spells a little bit less valuable, but rats are really good in fast formats because their opponent's just going to be kind of flooding the board. I find this card to be excellent. I would give this an A, especially because you can set it up more than most rats where you can actually be casting spells and your opponent has no idea that you're setting up a wrath because you're, from their perspective, still playing stuff out. Totally. And then all of a sudden you cast this, like you're playing against blue green and you're like, this is going to kill all of your creatures and it's only going to kill one of my four creatures or whatever. Right. And as you said, you can just name zero and just blow up the board if you need to. Okay. A for expel the interlopers. I like A for expel the interlopers. Great card. Uh, Virtue of loyalty is next. It's also three white, white. This is an enchantment at mythic rare. And it says at the beginning of your end step, put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. Untap those creatures. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. And then it's also got more. It's an adventure called Ardenvale Fealty, which is one and a white for an instant. Create a 2-2 two, two white knight creature token with vigilance. Are you serious right now? Yeah. You I mean, get a two mana ridiculous. instant speed vigilance token that you can use to ambush or change math or do whatever. And then when you get to five, you play it and it just like, spews counters over all your guys. Yeah, I mean this 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 card is is just a huge bomb. Uh, I would give Virtue of Loyalty an A plus because a two mana two two vigilance at instant speed and a bomb five mana enchantment that will win you the game in like two turns if your opponent doesn't do something. Like it even untaps your creatures, so you can be attacking and blocking at the same time. That's crazy. So that's an anti combo because the knight token already has vigilance, so oh, you're not really getting any. So we'll give it a C. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Virtue of loyalty. No, yeah, that's an AA plus card right there. That is incredible. It's a mythic rare and it earned it. Um, last white card is called Moonshaker Cavalry. This is eight mana, five white, white, white for a 6-6 six, six spirit knight at mythic rare. It's got flying. And when it enters the battlefield, creatures you control gain flying and get plus X plus X until end of turn where X is the number of creatures you control. Yeah, this I mean, is the crater hoof behemoth. <laughs> right. Like if it hits the battlefield and you have any semblance of a board, you just probably win on the spot. But come on, eight mana, five white, white, white. Like what, what, what's the play there? Well, I, the way I would see this card is I, I would see this as a build around. I think it's a I think it's a build around A because if you cast this card and have any sort of board presence, you're probably going to win the game. Right. right? You're, you're going to like, let's say you have three creatures in play. You cast this. You, you, all your creatures get plus four, plus four and flying. Right. Like it's over. How, how easy is it to win from there, Barry? Right. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is five white, white, white. That's no joke. Like that's, that's a, that's a really big commitment. So I think it, it is a build around kind of like you would any eight mana win the game spell where you have to build a specific deck that wants to get to eight mana. Like whether that involves, you know, a bunch of removal plus ramp, like you're playing green white, for example, or you're like blue white with a bunch of card draw and ways to stall out the game. 
But either way, your this 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 card is really kind of warping the rest of your deck around it. But because the payoff is so good. So what is the? So you want to give it a build around A? I am curious. What grade would you give it non build around? Like it's not That's quite an F, but it's like approaching right, like eight mana triple white. I mean, that's the, that's the thing is you can't really give it a non-builder on grade because eight mana spells you just can't naturally cast. Okay. It's like, it's not Emrakul, it doesn't cost 15, but you just don't put, or you shouldn't put eight mana spells in your deck without a pretty good plan as to how you are going to get those spells into play. Okay. Yeah. Very powerful. Uh, maybe something to consider for sealed if it's a little slower, or slow enough, or if you have just that enough ramp. Okay. That moves us to blue. Our first card... <laughs> Way on the other end of the spectrum is Elusive Otter. It is uh, blue for a 1-1 one, one otter. It's rare. And it has Prowess, and which is whenever you cast a non-creature spell, it gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. And then it also has creatures with power less than Elusive Otter's power. Can't block it. And then it's also an adventure. It's got Grove's Bounty, which is off color. It's green X for a sorcery. Distribute X plus one, plus one counters among any number of target creatures you control. Yeah, so here the adventure is the really big payoff because you're getting X counters for X and a green. That is huge. You, you pay five mana and you get four plus one plus one counters. Also divide it however you want. Maybe you put two on your one three flyer to get past their three three and then two on your two two to also get past their three three, opening the door for like seven points of attacks. You also get on the flip side a prowess that a uh, creature that's hard to block when you start pumping it. How I would look at this card is I would put Grove's Bounty in most decks just by itself. Mm -hmm. Like paying X green for XX worth of stats, hasty, divided as you choose is a pretty powerful thing. Obviously, if you have like one creature in play, Grove's Bounty functions like an aura. It's a little risky. If you have no creatures in play, it does nothing. But on an average board, if you cast this in the middle of the game, you're going to have a significant advantage. Definitely. And green also, of course, known for having a bunch of creatures on the battlefield. So target shouldn't be a problem. Right. And then if you have uh, the blue mana, yeah, I would play Elusive Otter, but I wouldn't view this as a blue-green card more as like a green card with a slight blue upside. So it's better if you can play both halves, of course, but I would mostly want this as the green half rather than the blue half. Right, so if, you, if you're if you drafting and you're in green and you see this, do not pass it by. Say, wait a second, Grove's yeah. Bounty, I can just play that, that's fine. Yeah, I've um, lost really badly to that card already out of a red-green deck that just didn't look like it could even cast the Otter. So what do you think, B minus, B? I think this is probably a B, B plus level in, card. For, for green. It, it's like a B level card in green, B plus if you can cast the otter. Okay. Uh, next is Ingenious Prodigy. This is X and a blue for a zero one human wizard at rare. It has skulk, which means that creature, it, it can't be blocked by creatures with power greater than it. And it enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it. So the zero one's the baseline, and then you add from there. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, if it's if Ingenious Prodigy has one or more plus one plus one counters on it, you may, you may remove a plus one plus one counter from it. And if you do, you draw a card. Now that's your upkeep. So you do have to have this thing survive all the way to your next turn to start doing that. But man, that's there's a lot of good stuff going on here. I mean, most blue decks, I think, would play X and a blue for an X, you know, a O one with X counters and Skulk, right? I think like, so. A four mana, three, four Skulk, and then you can start or five cashing mana, cards. Four, five. Yeah. Like, and then, and then, if it ever lives, you start drawing extra cards like that. That that's pretty awesome, I think. And you do, right? I mean, I I, I feel like if I had this thing and I had the chance to start cashing in cards, unless it was performing like a really significant role on the battlefield, I would just start getting cards off it. I've, I, I've somehow had this card three times so far. And oh, wow. I, well, I've been drafting a lot of uh, blue decks. Actually, okay. as, a, as a short aside, uh, after the rare, after this show, if you, if, um, you normally don't listen to the sign-offs, I want to talk a little bit about draft strategy today because the show got delayed a little bit. So we're already kind of into the format. I wanted to give you a, at least a little bit of a, a talk on the format just, just, just for, for those who are okay. around. Um, Anyways, I like Blue X a lot. Uh, <laughs> okay. And uh, part of that is, is, is uh, I've ended up with Ingenious Prodigy a bunch, and my experience with it has been really good. Because if you have this in play in your upkeep, I've had it in play probably 10 upkeeps, and I've drawn cards, I think, nine of those 10. Yeah, okay. One of the times I didn't because 
it was a four five and they had a four four and I wanted to attack them. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and look, a three four can attack past a four four because of skulk, but I still wanted just to attack them. Like I wasn't looking to to do three damage. I was looking to do four. You know, uh-huh. uh, the greedy Luis. Yeah, well, the, the basically the payoff on this card is big. The risk is low, and it's modular where you can just cast it for anywhere between three mana and ten mana. I wouldn't usually cast this for two or three mana. Four is like about the floor. But look, you're stuck on three lands. Just cast it and draw your two cards yeah. if you if it survives twice. Like yep. that's that's still great. I I would give the prodigy an A. Like okay. it's it's just a really strong card. Like the biggest weakness of the card is you is you cast it and they kill it and you are you're down some mana. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that's like a huge a huge weakness. You know? No, it's not a big knock. Yeah, it, removal existing isn't <clears throat> really a great argument. Uh, next one is called Sleep Cursed Fairy. This is blue for a th- wow, blue for a three three flying ward two. It's a fairy wizard at rare. What's the downside? Uh, and it Sleep Cursed Fairy enters a battlefield tapped with three stun counters on it. So it's going to be a while before you get to use it. Though you can pay one and a blue to untap it, which will either untap it or remove a stun yeah. counter. I like that. That's actually fine. I mean, again, thinking ideally, you play it on turn one. Okay, fine. It's not doing anything for the first few turns. But, you know, what, what is it called? Uh, spend? Kind of has yeah, spend it's, it's vibes. Like, it's like an Errant Aferen, Ephemeron. Yeah, a little baby one. And that card is amazing. And this thing also has Ward 2, which is, that's relevant. Like, that actually Super matters. Relevant. Yeah. So I this card actually looks really strong to me. Normally, these ones that you know, come in and say, well, you don't really get to use this forever, um, suffer a lot. And this would, I mean, you know, look, if you top deck it later, you know, you may have to dump a bunch of mana to get it rolling, but a three, three flying war two is like a legit, you know, that's a four mana creature. Yeah. I, I think uh sleep cursed fairy kind of feels like a Delver of secrets that always flips <laughs> yeah. like after a few turns. And here's the cool part. Somehow I've also had this card like five times, uh, cause I had two in one deck and one in another deck, even on the release day. And then I've had it twice since then. Uh huh. If you cast it on turn one, it's like you said, it's an ephemeron. It just, it has suspend, you know, you cast it on turn one and then a couple turns later it starts attacking and it's great. If you top deck it later, you just cast it end of turn, you pay, pay four mana and then you remove the last counter then you pay two mana. And it's just, it was effectively a three, three for flyer, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You had to sink six mana into it or whatever, four mana into it. Um, but it ends up still doing exactly what you want to do. And there's a lot of worlds in between. There's worlds where you, you activate it once over the course of the three turns or you activate it twice or whatever. So I've found sleep curse fairy to just be excellent. I think, I think it's like an a minus, like you, you would be really happy starting a draft with this card. Just kind of has vigilance too somehow, like after it gets rolling and that's just awesome. Uh, A minus for sleep curse fairy. That's a lot of action for one mana. Uh, next is Extraordinary Journey. It's blue, blue, XX for an enchantment at rare. And when it enters the battlefield, exile up to X target creatures. For each of those cards, its owner may play it for as long as it remains exiled. Whenever one or more non-token creatures enter the battlefield, if one or more of them entered from exile or was cast from exile, you draw a card. This ability triggers only once each turn. Now, it's kind of a convoluted card, isn't it? So basically it's a blue, blue XX bounce spell. Yes. Because exiling creatures, then they can cast from exile or you can cast from exile because it can actually hit either side of the board. It's relevant to hit either side is just, it's fine. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't be super stoked about that, right? Four mana bounce one thing, six mana bounce two things. But the second part of it makes it a pretty strong card. Like, okay, imagine this. Your opponent casts this for six mana, bounces your two creatures, on your next turn, you're, you're going to cast one of those creatures unless you have something better to do. Mm-hmm. But if you do, they draw a card. Yeah. So ne- ne- And then if you can't cast both in the same turn, they're going to end up drawing two cards off the whole exchange because it only triggers once a turn. But imagine they bounce a four drop and a five drop. Yeah, you're probably taking two turns to cast them. So now they spent six mana to bounce two creatures and draw two cards. But it, it doesn't end there because now anytime either player casts a card from Adventure, they also draw a card. Uh-huh. Nominally, you could cast this for two mana if you think there's going to be a lot of adventures happening and just forego the bounce. I don't think that is really going to happen. I, I've had the card and I never was tempted to do that. But really just casting this as 
a scalable bounce spell where the floor is, you know, four mana bounce one creature. That's not like something it's I'm thrilled pretty with. Pretty low floor, yeah. But the floor of four mana bounce creature draw a card, well, you just always put four mana bounce creature draw a card in your decks pretty much. Like Definitely. that is a good card. Yes. And then the ceiling is so much higher because you can A, spend six or eight mana to bounce a bunch of things, have a huge effect on the late game. Like, look, you know, we were just talking about how you can't put eight mana cards in your deck without a plan. You can put cards that cost two to four mana in your deck that you can also cast for eight because then yeah. sometimes you will just draw them when you have eight lands in play mm -hmm. and you bounce three things in the game, you know, close to ends. And then the fact that it draws you a card over and over again during the course of the game is just fantastic. Look, the card's still kind of slow. I don't think it necessarily solves some of uh, what Blue is trying to solve. But if you combine this with cheap removal, if you combine it with adventures, like both of those things work really nicely. I, I would give it a B. But I've I've seen it do some pretty good work. Yeah, that sounds right to me. It, it does hit tokens as well, right? And just no, oh, yeah, they're just way. gone. That's nice. B for extraordinary journey. Next is uh, Italian's messenger, which is two and a blue for a one three flying fairy noble at rare. This is also our preview card, by the way. Whenever you attack with one or more fairies, draw a card, then discard a card. And whenever you discard a card this way, put a plus one plus one counter on target fairy you control. Great card. Yeah. I mean, Talion's Mister by itself is a three mana one three flying looter that just grows every turn. But it also kind of has haste if you have another fairy in play. It also can put the counters in different places if you want. Um, just just a great card. I mean, you only get one loot total no matter how many fairies you attack with. Right. But still, just one per turn is great. The fact that it self fuels means there's no downside to this card. I would put this in my deck as the only fairy. Yeah. Of course, if I drafted this, I would also try to draft more fairies because that makes it even better. I mean, imagine you just play the tap, tapper fairy, the snare fairy on turn one, and then just cast this turn three attack, immediately make your snare fairy a 2-2. Two -two. Yes. Like, you're already up, and you're getting card quality. So yes. I would give Talion's Messenger an A-. minus. This card too. If, if, you, if this card's on the battlefield, your opponent's going to feel a lot of pressure to get rid of it. Yeah, for people who play Lord of the Rings, right, you get to the second level of the ring, and you saw how those games went when you got to attack over and over and over again with a looter. Well, this is like that. <clears throat> and then yeah. this is in a set where not everybody has it. So that's really good. Um, Asinine Antics is next. It's two blue blue for a sorcery. This one's mythic rare. It says you may cast it as though it had flash if you pay two more. So that bumps it up to a full six. Uh, for each creature your opponent's control, create a cursed roll token attached to that creature. And if you remember, that's the one that uh, makes the creature a 1-1. One, one. So it basically hmm. just curses all their creatures. I, I will say that this card looked pretty good, but then, you know what? These cards always play so much worse than they look. It just turns out making creatures 1-1s one isn't killing them, and in this set it's especially not killing them because there's a lot of things that interact poorly for you. I think this card's probably closer to a D than it is to a B, but I would give it a C. I, like, I agree. It, it's a C trending downwards. A lot of times this is just not going to do what you think it's going to do, especially at Mythic Rare. You 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 feel like it it could be a big blowout, but they just never play out in that big, big scenario that you want. Yeah. Uh, next is Farsight Ritual. This is two blue blue for an instant at rare. It's got bargain and it says, look at the top four cards of your library. If this spell was bargained, look at the top eight cards of your library instead. Put two of them in your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So yeah, I mean, card as, pain, draw spell? as painful as this is, I think this is just not that much better than any other card draw spell that you can put in your deck. Like quick studies, three mana draw two. Uh, you know, the the Fey Court is three, is five mana draw three. Mm -hmm. And this is, yeah, it gives you some selection. And if you bargain it, which is not that hard to do, you get a lot of selection. But I'm still just looking at this card and thinking like, when am I going to take this over a good interactive card or a good creature? And I don't think you should because I think... Whether you had, you only have so many slots for card drawn. I've been trying to see, you know, what the upper limit on that is, <laughs> but you, you can't put five card draw spells in your deck. And I don't think it's going to matter that much, whether it's Farsight Ritual, Quick Study, uh, you know, before the Fake Court, any of those things. That makes this not a, a valuable card to take. So I think it's like a C, C plus level card, Yeah. but I just wouldn't prioritize it. Yeah, this is as good as the other ones. It's just, uh, yeah. There's a uh, lot of them. Yeah, would it matter to you if you had particularly... I don't know, powerful or synergistic cards that you could find where like you would actually be incentivized to bargain it and dig for, let's say you had the best card in the set, whatever that ends up being, you know, that type of thing. 
Yeah, you have a gruff triplets or something. You have like a gruff that, triplets or, and you're green blue. You know, are you more likely to want to get Farsight Ritual rolling because you can look at eight cards and find your gruff triplets or whatever? Yeah, yeah sure. It's a little better because that because of that. Okay, it, but not enough to like move it around significantly. No, it's not going to make me like I don't know, go go crazy for it. Okay. Next is um is it Twining Twins? Twining twins, twining I believe, twins. Yes. Yeah, two blue blue for a 4-4 four, four fairy wizard at rare. It's got flying, vigilance, and ward one. So sold. But we've also got a white adventure. It is swift spiral. It's an instant for one and a white. Exile target non-token creature. Return it to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. So you get kind of a slow blink but it's attached to a very rock solid four mana, four, four flyer with vigilance and ward one. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Also you can target their creatures so you can get them out of the way for a turn if you want. Mm -hmm. And just does everything you want. Uh, yeah. Just an A for twining twins. I mean, yeah. this is also, by the way, you don't need to be playing white. This card is yes. close to, like an A minus without the white, but still just a card you're happy to take. So yeah. don't worry about the white and don't put it in your deck just for the white half. You got to be playing blue. But yeah. as a blue card, it is it is a a minus a. Right. It is great on rate. Uh, next is virtue of knowledge, which is four and a blue for an enchantment. This is a mythic rare, and it says if a permanent entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. And then it's also an adventure. It's Vantress Visions, which is one in a blue for an instant. And it says copy target activated or triggered ability you control. You may choose new targets for the copy. Wow, this two very two clunky tastes. <laughs> yeah, this is an F. You're, you're just not going to yeah, do this. I, I am not virtuing of knowledge. Next, last, I should say, blue card is Horned Lock Whale. This is four blue blue for a whale. It's rare. It is a 6-6 six, six, flash ward two that enters a battlefield tapped unless it's your turn. So no ambushing, but you can throw it in on end step uh, of your opponent's turn and, and get some surprise attacks going. But it also has an adventure. It's Lagoon Breach, which is one and a blue for an instant. And it says the owner of target attacking creature you don't control puts it on the top or bottom of their library. So you get that for pretty cheap. It just wanted a blue, but it does have to be attacking. I mean, Lagoon Breach is awesome. One mm. in a blue to 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 put one of their creatures on top or bottom is just a really strong ability. And stapled to a six mana six six with flash and ward two. I mean, this card this card is a bomb. This is a really good reason to to be in blue. Yeah. And uh I would take the whale very highly. It's, it's an A. It's yeah. just a huge finisher that also comes on a cheap removal spell, like the perfect combination. Yeah, it's exactly what you want for a slower deck. Okay, that moves us to black, where our first card is called Spiteful Hex Mage. This is black for a 3-2 human warlock at rare. And when it enters a battlefield, you create a cursed roll token attached to target creature you control. And again, that is the one that makes it a 1-1. A one -one. So <laughs> the floor on this is 1-mana 1-1. One 1-mana one -one. One 1-1 one -one that maybe if you can knock the roll off later can, can upgrade itself. Yeah, and you can also put a roll on something else if you want. Like you can put it on a rat, you know, and get right. a one mana three two. So the idea I mean, here, though, is to upgrade the roll from something else later. Is that the? Yeah, it's to either like play this. Like, imagine you play this turn one and turn two, you play the conceited witch right. uh, roll and give it a you know the wicked roll, wicked. and all of a sudden you've got a four three attacking on turn two. Right, and, that, and that's, that's pretty good. Proven not that hard, right? Like a lot of cards put rolls on. Yeah, and, and like I said, you just put it on a rat, or you just put the roll on like you have a, a random small creature that you don't intend to attack or block with much, and you can just spiteful hex mage it or something. Yeah. So, I I think that the payoff isn't like super high or anything, but if I had a bunch of the roll creating cards, I, I think I would play this because sometimes you will attack for four on turn two, and that's going to be a lot of pressure, and. It works fine if uh, you've got cards that that bargain. It's a pretty good combo as just bargain fuel because that makes it a one mana three two with upside, which that that's pretty good even in, even in the middle of the game. That's the thing we always talk about mana efficiency and if you can go turn five, you cast this, you cast Candy Grapple, sacking the cursed roll, and you cast a two drop. You had a really efficient turn. You played three spells, and your opponent is gonna is gonna really feel that because you just end up with an extra three two in play that can attack or block. So. 
I think this card's like a C, but just look for ways to kind of make it into a C plus, you know, <laughs> like it's, yeah, it's a fine card to put in most, almost any black deck. I bet you're not, not cutting this card. Agreed. It's just not like a bomber or anything. Right. It's, it's, it's ceiling isn't super high, but floor is pretty good too. Next is cruel somnophage, which is one in a black for a nightmare at rare. It is a star star and it says power and toughness for each equals a number of creature cards in all graveyards. But it's also got a blue adventure. It's called Can't Wake Up. And it's one and a blue for a sorcery. It says target player mills four cards. So again, we go back to kind of the basics here. Well, on one hand, this doesn't have the safety net. It, it can be a zero, zero. You, it can just die. So you, you don't get to just cast this on turn two, probably ever. I, it'd probably be quite rare that you could cast Cruel Somnifage on turn two. So then the question becomes, if, if I have to wait around for this and I'm get my two mana creature, what does it need to be to make it worth it? You know, a 4-4, four, four, a 3-3, three, three, like which one of those do you need it to be? Um, and then, of course, if you can cast the blue side of it that can't wake up, you know, how much does that change the equation? I'm not that excited well, about this one, Luis. I, I, you know, it has no extra abilities. All right. Well, I, I, I hate to break it to you, mm -hmm. but... This card's awesome. You're, you're never okay. going to cut it from, from a black okay. deck. Okay, explain. And two mana six, six, six or whatever. <laughs> it, it, what? It, Why? How, how am I getting it, six creatures in graveyards? Like, what? It's just the, the game plays out. and So you're saying the it, format plays out such that the lots of trading happens and removal happens yeah. and stuff like that. Okay. And it, it's a two mana spell. Like, look, you can't cast it on turn two basically ever. And that's totally fine. It's... It's all, it also is better if you have access to uh, blue mana. But my experience with the card is you can frequently play it as a two mana 3-3 three, three, and then just over the course of the game or two, or sorry, the next turn or two, it just grows bigger as as magic happens, as interaction happens. And later in the game, it's going to be a 7-7. Seven, seven. It's going to be an 8-8. Eight, eight. Plus, sometimes you mill, mill them for four and then raise dead it and mill them for four and all of a sudden it's huge. Or you mill yourself. You a lot of times you're just going to want to mill yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think this card is, is very good. Look, if you put it in a creature light deck and you can't cast the blue part, you're going to sometimes end up in a spot where it's not going to be all that exciting. But so far that hasn't really been the case. Like it, okay. if, if, if I see this early, I consider it a black card and I look to try to find uh cards, you know, and I, and I hope to go into blue black and pick up removal and stuff like that. But even if you end up in like black red, I, I just think you should play the card. Just wow. make sure okay. you have a decent amount of creatures in your deck if you're if you're doing that sort of I thing. I mean, that does make this format the exception, right? Like most formats, this would be mediocre. I don't I don't know though. I I, 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 mean, don't, think, like I don't think cr creatures aren't just flowing into the graveyard. Look, I played with Mortivore back in Odyssey, the two black black that was an XX. And that card was just a bomb. Granted, limited was weirder and weaker back then, and it was a graveyard set. But like in most limited formats, an XX for two mana or X is the number of creatures in graveyards. Like you, it doesn't take much before you can cast it as a two mana three three or something like that. Okay. And then it just is upside from there. Okay. So what do you want to give it? I'd give it a B plus. Wow. I think that I think the card is very good. Like I'm I'm very happy with it. I have a a deck that I haven't actually played with yet on, on magic online that has two of them. And I'm excited about that. Cause like they stack really nicely. Oh, incredible restraint. I figured you'd be playing it right now. Uh, <laughs> next is uh, Lord Skitter's blessing, which is one in a black for an enchantment at rare. When Lord Skitter's blessing enters the battlefield, create a wicked roll token attached to target creature you control. Again, that's the one that gives plus one plus one. And when the thing dies, the opponent loses a life. And it says at the beginning of your draw step, if you control an enchanted creature, you lose one life and you draw an additional card. Nice. Yeah, I mean, that's sweet. If if they kill the creature that has the the roll on it, then you end up uh maybe this card doesn't do much for a little while. Mhm. Mm but it's not hard to have an enchanted creature and if you just get one card off this, like if it survives for one turn cycle, I think you're going to be pretty happy with how that turns out you replace this got a wicked roll and then later in the game whenever you have any rolls this can this can uh, draw you cards it yeah. is not optional like yeah you you, ha you do have to watch out for that 
Yeah, this isn't a free roll, right? Because one in a black for a wicked roll is not kind of a free roll because you get a roll off it for free. <laughs> it's <a> free roll. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it is. You would not pay one in a black for a wicked roll, but that is worth something, right? It's a you know some some portion of a card, and then like you said, if you ever just get to your your draw step with an enchanted thing, then it replaces itself, and you're kind of off to the races. So I like that. That that seems totally fine to me. Yeah. Also note that. Uh, if your opponent puts cursed roll on one of your creatures, it works there too. Oh, it does. Okay. Yeah. So this is counterplay against a cursed roll, though they can also start forcing you to lose life by cursing one of your creatures if they really want to. Okay. Um, I like it actually. I like Lord Skitter's Blood, especially only for two mana. That seems pretty yeah. decent. Um, does it get into the B range? I would give it a B. Yeah. B build around, I, you know, you do have to like have more role making things, but I think, it, I think because it fuels itself, I wouldn't call it a build around, mm -hmm. uh, but it is a card that does get better as you. Yeah. I guess it, what I'm know? saying is, is if you have no other roles, then I, I wouldn't, I would be like a lot more dubious about Lord Skitter's blessing where if I had three or four, even I would be like, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm, we're going. All right. Next is tangled colony. This is one in a black for a three, two rat at rare. It can't block. Uh, and when it dies, you create X one, one black rat creature tokens with this creature can't block where X is the amount of damage dealt to it this turn. Oh man. It's like the, the dream is like, Oh, I want to block your six, six, but it can't. So it's like, well, they, they, they figured that one out. Yeah. <laughs> but it is a three, two for only two. So it does have to be dealt with. And you know, I could easily see the scenario where they're like, fine, block with my 2-2, two, two, and you get your two rats out of the deal, and off you go. Yeah, and, you know, the fact that it attacks for three a turn, or you put like a wicked roll on it, and you're just like attacking for four a turn, like, your opponent is going to have to do something about this. Yeah. Like, they can't, they can't just ignore it forever, and given that, at some point, you're going to get to cash it in. You also... You know, it's a little, a little awkward, but you might be able to just kill it yourself, and... Mm and get get a bunch of uh, rats out of it that would i'm not sure exactly what would lead you how you would do that you know but imagine the stone splitter bolt that's probably the best way the red mm -hmm. x instant you bargain it end of turn you stone splitter bolt it for 10 <laughs> yeah there you go <laughs> that actually seems like kind of a mondo combo yeah i don't like these type of cards generally i could see it being good in an aggressive deck right that's where yeah. like you can just pound with it but every other thing mid-range control decks you know a Two mana creature that can't block that dies into other creatures that can't block it, th that to me is is too often just a blank. But if if I'm assertive, if I have a black deck that's looking to get in there, then then Tangle Colony has a home for sure. Yeah, I mean this actually was a great object lesson because uh, I was streaming and uh, I was drafting like a green black kind of like rampy deck, and someone's like, "Wait, why didn't you take can can Tangled Colony? Isn't that card good?" And the answer is. Yes, the card is good, but not in this deck. It's not good. Right. And this card, I think, is like a B plus in an aggro deck and like a D in a control deck. Agreed. That's so, what I think so too. just you, you kind of got to know where you land on this. Gumdrop Poisoner. I know where I land on a Gumdrop Poisoner. This is two and a black for a three two human warlock at rare. It's got lifelink. And when it enters a battlefield, up to one target creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn, where X is the amount of life you gained this turn. It's also got Tempt with Treats, which is an instant adventure for black, and it says create a food token. So you make this thing, cast something else, wait till you get to turn five or whatever, and then crack the food and play your gumdrop poisoner and kill something. Yeah, I mean, five mana, three, two, gain three life, give a creature minus three, minus three with lifelink even gross, amazing card. Yes. And just paying one mana for uh, a food and then casting this on turn three and then attacking with it can be great too. Also, if you have other ways to gain life, like, you know, the one, three barrel naughty, the flying uh, fairy, maybe you uh, attack with that in another fairy, you gain a life and you just play this on turn three and uh, give a creature minus one, minus one or something. No matter how you slice it, gumdrop poisoner is awesome. That card is great. Yeah. And as you said, just even just three mana, three, two lifelink is already good. Um, B plus, A minus. I like A minus for yeah, this one, honestly. I, I think I, th I think it's just too strong. Yeah, especially because the adventure is on color as well. Uh, next is Lord Skitter 
Sewer King. This is two and a black for <laughs> That's what a, they call me. <laughs> <laughs> the Sewer King. Two and a black for a 3-3 three, three legendary rat noble at rare. Whenever another rat enters the battlefield under your control, exile up to one target card from an opponent's graveyard. And at the beginning of combat on your turn, you get a 1-1 one, one black rat creature token with this creature camp block. So you get a three mana 3-3 three, three that spits out rats every combat. And then when they ETB, they snipe cards from their graveyard, which is, you know, minor upside. But the the fact that this thing just fuels itself, it needs no other synergies is, is great. Yeah, I think Lord Skitter is probably a B plus just. And if you're in a rat deck, you could get it up to an A level card, you know, if, if, with, without even that much work. You just cast this card and then you get a rat every turn. And your opponent's going to have to deal with this or you're going to end up with like five rats and, and, and you're going to be they're going to be in in a, in, a, yeah. in a lot of trouble yeah and this one can block and is a three three for three so all good this is just all upside b plus i will give it a b plus yeah b plus b plus for lord skitter sewer king next is beseech the mirror this is one black 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 so four mana total for a sorcery at mythic it's got bargain and is there a search your library for a card exile it face down then shuffle if this spell was bargained you may cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost if that spell's mana value is four or less put the exiled card into your hand if it wasn't cast this way so if you don't bargain it, it's the most expensive demonic tutor. And if you do, you can tutor and then cast a thing as long as it casts four or less. Interesting. You know, the knock on tutors, right? Four mana, three mana, whatever they are, is that it adds that much mana to your to the cost of the card. If you yeah. can bargain this, you can mitigate that. But yeah. You can't, and you can't search up your expensive stuff. Yeah. The, the, so the question is, how much... Do you want a card that only works when you bargain it and only gets four drops and costs triple black? My answer is you don't. This is an F. Like, right. you just shouldn't put this card in your deck. It's, yeah. it's unfortunate. I think they had to cost it at triple black probably for Constructed, and it all it still actually looks good in older formats. It, in Limited, if this card costs like three and a black, it would actually be kind of interesting. It would but, be, yes. But I think at triple black, that just that just kills my um, any, any sort of enthusiasm for this. Uh, Devouring Sugar Ma is next. This is two black black for a 6-6 six, six horror. It is a rare. It has Menace and Trample. So four mana, 6-6 six, six Menace, Trample. What's the downside? At the beginning of your upkeep, you may sacrifice an artifact, enchantment, or token. So it has to, it, basically you can bargain. If you don't, tap Devouring Sugar Ma. Okay, that's not so bad. You know, back in the day, they would like sacrifice it or it would do six to you or something like that. Now it just takes <laughs> yes. it out of commission for a turn. But it also has an adventure. It's white. It's have for dinner. And it is one and a white for an incident. And it makes a one, one white human creature token and a food token. Whew. I think I like it either way. As in, like, you like it even if you can't cast the, yeah. the e either half? I think I think if you support it, like, that is such gnarly stats. 6-6 six, six Menace Trample for four that, like, you don't need to keep it alive for too many turns for it to really have a big impact. Yeah. I mean, this is a real clear sign of power creep in the sense that yeah. not only is this optional, it doesn't force you to sacrifice, it doesn't punish you if you choose not to. Right. So, like, you can just cast this. Let's say you cast this, you sack your food, you hit him for six, you sack another thing, you hit him for six, and then you run out of uh, stuff to sacrifice, but you don't have, and you don't have it for a while, you can just let it sit there for three turns, and then at some point you find a, a way to sacrifice, and you're all of a sudden, you're back in business. Like, right. things, things are good again. It also can block the first turn it comes down, because it doesn't trigger until your upkeep, so you pay four mana, six, six, go. They, they're going to have a really hard time attacking into your four mana six, six. And then you start playing the game of, of, am I tapping it or am I not? Yeah. And just have for dinner is also just not a bad card to cast. Not at all. Two, Two mana for turns. a one, one and a food. Yeah. yeah. I've found that the sugar maw is pretty great. Uh, I mean, the biggest downside is you sack something and then they kill it while you're attacking, you know, right. like they're, they're, right. that can happen. But I think overall it's still just a, it, it is a very strong card. Yeah. For me, you know, I think if you can cast half for dinner and devouring sugar ma, you know, I think we're into the B plus range, probably maybe a minus like very strong. 
But if you can't, it does bump it down. Like, yeah. you know, that, that puts me in the, the B minus range or something for the sugar ma. It I does like demand a lot. In black green that has like some support for it, it's probably closer to a B. Mm -hmm. In white black that can cast both halves, it's like, yeah, like you said, B plus, A minus. I also like it in a black green deck that has two prophetic prisms and a, a crystal grotto so it can cast half for dinner some amount of the time. Like, I think that is a good way to, to, to kind of go about it. Yeah, half for dinner is, looks really good. Uh, Rankles Prank is next. This is two black black for a sorcery at rare. It says, choose one or more. Each player discards two cards, each player loses four life, or each player sacrifices two creatures. Rankles at it again. Oh yeah, I mean this is a this is a pretty each player like, gnarly sacrifices card. two creatures. Can you break the synergy on this easily? The creature seems to be the easiest one. You so have the, either low value or no creatures, and they have sack two. That's the easiest one and the most rewarding because if you cast this on turn four, uh, you know when they've played two creatures and you've played none, you you're straight up two for oneing. To break the symmetry on the discard, that's a little harder. That's like casting this as your last card to get their two cards. That's just not going to happen very often. I wouldn't. I wouldn't really count on that. And then the losing four life. That's just easy. If are, are you aggressive? If you're aggressive, then that that's better for you than not. Right. Overall, my guess is this card is actually not that good. Like, interesting. I think that I think there's situations where it's going to be incredible. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of the time it's going to be hard to get a significant advantage on it, especially since. The losing four life and the sacking two creatures work at cross purposes because right. aggro decks don't want the third and control decks don't want the second. And then the each player discards two cards part is like kind of hard to get too much value on that. Like how are you maneuvering a game to this position? So I think this card is high variance and there will be times where it's great. I think mostly you're just not really supposed to put this card in your deck, if I had to guess. Okay, yeah, it, it is leaning on the flexibility very hard. I, th this definitely falls into the, you know, people are going to have to beat me with it card uh, category, I mean. Where do yeah, you want to start time, it off? C? This time I, I'm, I'm not arguing with you about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Like C? I, I mean, it does have a wide range of things that it does that are powerful. You know, uh, let's just give it Rankle's Prank a C and then we'll, we'll take it from there. The next is The End. It is two black black for an instant at rare. This spell costs two less to cast if your life total was five or less. And it says exile target creature or planeswalker searches controller's graveyard hand and library for any number of cards with the same name. Is that permanent and exile them? That player shuffles then draws a card for each exiled uh, for each card exiled from their hand this way. So it's a four mana removal spell. Exile a creature or planeswalker. In limited, you know, it's you you're often not going to find a second copy. And if you do, it'll just be the one. And then if you happen to be at low life total, it only costs two, cost black black. Yeah. And, there's nothing not to get, like here. Well, you also get to look at their deck and hand. True. Like that that's a pretty significant advantage. I, I've cast this card a couple times and like Knowing what's in their hand is great. Knowing what's in their deck is pretty good too. Like, can I fail to I, find? Yeah, you don't have to. If you if you kill a creature that that you don't mind them drawing later, or if they have it in their hand, can I say you know what you can keep it? Yeah, if you want to do that too, you can do that too. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I like B for the end just because it's yeah. like a really good removal spell. Like exiling seems relevant, and then if you are in a pinch, it can be cheaper. So I like all that. Yeah, I do too. Um, what about Ashiok Wicked Manipulator? You said this card's really good, right? Yeah, I think it is. It's uh, three black black for a Planeswalker, um, an Ashiok, of course. It has five loyalty to start with. It's Mythic Rare. It's plus one. Look at the top two cards of your library. Exile one, put one in your hand. So it's better than draw a card most of the time. Like It, it lets you choose from two, so that's significantly better. The downside is it it does make your deck too smaller, so if the game goes long, you could end up, you know, feeling feeling that a little bit. It's minus two is make two one one black nightmare creature tokens with at the beginning of the combat on your turn. If a card is put into exile this turn, put a plus one plus one counter on this creature. So the kind of joke with that is you play this, make two one ones, and then next turn if you plus one it, they get a plus one plus one counter each, which is great. 
The minus seven is target player exiles the top X cards in a library, where X is the total mana value of cards you own in exile. And that's actually pretty interesting, too, because it starts out at five loyalty. If you go plus one, plus one, you're at seven already. And if you exiled, you know, a couple big cards, that could be something. The other thing is it has a static ability, which doesn't come up often, but is relevant, which is if you would pay life while your library has at least that many cards in it, exile that many cards from the top of your library instead. Mm. So if you have some life payment cards, of which there's not like a ton of, it lets you exile cards instead of paying life, which then fuels the minus seven. Mostly how this card plays is you play it, you minus two it immediately and hope to protect it. It's at three loyalty. You have two one one blockers at the very least, plus whatever else you had. Next turn, you plus one, you draw a card, and then your two one ones become two twos. And then you play maybe plus one the turn after that or minus two it, whatever, whatever you need to do to, to kind of, uh, you know, play the game. But a five mana planeswalker that can go up to six loyalty immediately or go down to three loyalty with two blockers. That's a pretty substantial card. And if this stays in play for a number of turns, your opponent is going to be losing because you're you're either getting two creatures a turn or a card a turn, and those creatures grow as you as if Ashiok stays in play. Plus, eventually you can get to the ultimate and just mill them for 16 or something. Yeah, the ultimate is in range, right? Comes down to five plus one, you're already at six. Yeah. So that that actually is a thing. A lot of times ultimates, you know, kind of never happen, but this one you could definitely craft a game around it. Yeah, it seems strong. Yeah, I, I I like Ashiok. I mean, it's it's an A. You'll put it in your deck. You'll you'll try to build around it. Planeswalkers like this that dominate the game play really well with like board presence and removal. So you know, go go towards that. Not that not that you wouldn't be doing some amount of that anyway. But it is it is good to know that like that is that is your goal. You have an easy goal when yeah. you have a card like this that wins you the game if it stays in play. Then it is actually you know, something that you can build towards. Like not every deck has that. Some decks have to kill their opponent or they will lose. That's right. And this this is a classic Planeswalker template, right? Plus yeah. one draw a card, minus two. Do uh, something. Create blockers, yeah. Okay, so A for Ashiok. Next is Lich Knight's Conquest. This is four and a black for a sorcery at rare. Sacrifice any number of artifacts, enchantments, and or tokens. Return that many creature cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. Super bargain. Yeah, you basically get to bargain away a bunch of stuff and put that many creatures into play. This card, I think, has its highs, but mostly is going to have lows. It looks like a build around B to me, where if you can build a black deck that like gets a lot of cards in the graveyard, maybe you have uh, Rowan's Grim Bargain or whatever, the the three mana uh, draw two, lose two that lets you like scry four or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that can dump cards in your graveyard and you have a bunch of creatures and you trade off and then you cast this sacking three food to put three creatures into play. Like that is cool. That does something. Yeah. I just don't think it's going to happen very often. Yeah. We talk about setup costs, you know, for these type of cards. <laughs> and this one has two columns of setup costs going. It needs creatures in your graveyard, which mm -hmm. as you said, maybe that happens a little more often than on an average set, but still that, that can be a thing and it has to be yours. And then you also need artifacts, enchantments, and or tokens that you actually want sacrificed to this as well. And in order to make it worth it, you need at least two, right? Like yeah. minimum two. So the setup cost for me is too high for this. I just could see it doing nothing too often, even if you, even if it lets you dream a little, you know? Uh, but, oh, I'm gonna sacrifice four foods and get back my four best things. Um, I, I would give it, I'd probably give it an F, but I, you know, maybe a D or something in case there's a little more going on. Yeah, I, I don't think it's really going to work, unfortunately. Um, it's just too fragile to set up. Yeah. Um, next is Specter of Mortality. This is three black black for a three three Specter at rare. It's got flying, and when it enters the battlefield, you may exile one or more creature cards from your graveyard. When you do, each other creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn, where X is the number of cards exiled this way. Fantastic card. Wow. Like th what the Spectre ends up doing is it's a five mana three, three that lets you kind of choose how much you want to sweep the board for. Obviously you won't always have, you know, infinite creatures in your graveyard. You do have to do some of that setup you were talking about, but one of the cool plays you can do with this is you attack with a two, two, they block with a four, four, then you, then you have an extra creature. Now you give all creatures minus two, minus two, and it kills their four, four. 
late in the game, this just kills everything if you want it to. And you can maneuver it such that maybe you have the highest toughness creatures in play and you kill all their stuff or most of their stuff and, and none of yours or some only some of yours. It's it's a great card. There will be games when you have no creature in your graveyard and it's like a five mana three three flyer, but if you get this card early enough, just build a deck with a lot of creatures. It's good in a creature heavy deck. Yes. That seems very it, powerful. And this oh, is, is where when you do this much to the board, your three three flyer actually looks quite big. You know, it's the thing left over. What do you want yeah. to give it though? Is it a B plus? I would say it's an A minus. Like okay. a huge a card, upside. I mean, look, sometimes you're just going to have a game where you just cast this card and give all creatures minus five, minus five. Like that is something you can do. That's right. All right. Last black card is Virtue of Persistence. This is five black black for an enchantment at Mythic. And it says at the beginning of your upkeep, put target creature card from a graveyard, a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. And then it also has a, an adventure. It's a sorcery called Lockthwain Scorn, which is one and a black for target creature gets minus three, minus three until end of turn, and you gain two life. Looks like I buried the lead a little there, Louise. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a little bit. I mean, virtual like Lockthwain Scorn is, is just like a B or whatever. Yeah, th- th- I think th- I think virtual persistence. It's not the best card in the set because I think Gruff Triplets is just has such an amazing effect on the board. I would struggle to give this anything less than an A, and Agreed. I could see I could see A plus because here's the split card: two mana kill a creature, gain two life, and seven mana win the game. Yeah, like isn't that the dream split? Could That's you construct a, a better split card than that? Perfect, and it's in the color you want, and it, it it's the same color for the adventure as the main card. So yeah, there's nothing to hate, you know. Virtue of Persistence is a slow win condition. It doesn't trigger until your upkeep, but you get any creature from the graveyard. Like it has to trigger once and you're just going to win the game. And the fact that it comes on a premium removal spell means it's an easy A. Yeah. I mean, I think Virtue of Persistence is awesome. I mean, it's, 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 it's the dream card for you. Like I, you, you, you love cards that like, basically there's no downside to, and this gives you the early gameplay and the late gameplay. So totally. it's, it's pretty great. I also love cards that let you build, like change your game plan to just simply get toward this end goal. And this is what this does. It's just perfect. I just kill uh, something early I'm and gives you inevitability. <laughs> yeah. It's unbelievable. Virtue of persistence, a plus give it to me. Next is red. We start with rotisserie elemental. Who's hungry. This is red for a one, one elemental with menace. It's rare. And whenever it deals combat damage to a player, put a skewer counter on it. <laughs> then I you love may, skewer counter. <laughs> then, you, then you may sacrifice it. If you do, exile the top X cards of your library, where X is the number of skewer counters on it, and you can play those cards this turn. Sweet. That's yeah, a this card's punchy good. little one drop right there. Like, it's a one mana, one, one menace that just whacks them a couple times, and then you get to cash it in. And you can play any number of those cards this turn. So if you set it up, like let's say you sack this on the third hit and you hit a land and a cheap spell and something else, you get to play like two of them. That That's pretty good. Like you don't need to play a lot of cards for this card to feel like it paid you off. The question that I have is wh- what do you see the play pattern being? Because you can't just sacrifice it whenever you want, right? It's when you hit no. them, you get a counter and then you can sacrifice it. So the window may close. Like if you try to get greedy, Right. And they just play like something that makes two tokens and all of a sudden your rotisserie elemental can't ever get in again because the uh, skewer counters don't make it bigger. It's still just a one one menace. Yeah. You know, then you may lose the window with which you have to uh, to sack it. Right. So the question becomes like, if you get the second counter on it, do you just cash the thing in? I mean, that's 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 gonna what's going to be difficult about playing with this card. Definitely is. It's, this is a press your luck card where it's like, yeah, okay, no way. <laughs> I, I hit you twice. I could cash it in now to, to to look at my top two and maybe play just one of them, and that's okay. But you know, if I wait one more turn, uh-huh. I'll have an extra land in play and a third counter, so maybe I get to play two of them or even three of them. But then they're like, and then they cast two blockers in the same turn, and you're like, oh, Ugh. or they or they kill this, or they just kill it. I think this is. I think the rotisserie elemental is a B because it's a. Uh, a one drop that if you play it on turn one is going to have a very good effect on the game. Yes. And even in the middle of the game, there, there are low resource games where people trade off and you have this on turn five and it can get an attack in and maybe you cash in right away or maybe you wait two turns. So I, I think that the card is, is quite strong. Yeah. I, I like B for a tissue element. Anything with a skewer counter, I'm in. So <laughs> next is um, Song of Totentons. And that is 
uh, red X for a sorcery at rare, and you get X one one black reacher. Uh, excuse me, creature black rat creature tokens with this creature can't block, and creatures you control gain haste until end of turn. <laughs> God, I've lost this card twice That's so far. Brutal. It is absurd. It it's a fireball that doesn't always kill you in one hit, but it doesn't have to because. If they cast this for six and attack you with their two creatures they already had plus this, you block three of them and you take like five or six damage, but then next turn you're getting attacked again. Yes. Like you die over two or three turns, but you die, and sometimes you just die immediately. Yeah. Gross. I, I think that this card is not only great in the rat deck for sure, it's worth splashing in other decks, and I would basically always play it because, look, you're playing a control deck, this card won't help you survive in any way, shape, or form. But if you're playing a control deck and you just get to nine mana and you just cast this, you just win the game. And that, that can be your win condition. Your win condition doesn't always have to keep you alive. That's awesome. Interesting to, to just cast it at, for red as well. Creatures you oh, control do you give, gain haste. I, I, do you give all your creatures haste? Feels yeah, I don't, like a very rare occurrence, but possible. I don't think that'll happen too often. But yes, you could technically do that. Yeah. Um, so what do you give Song of Totentons? Is it an A? Like, does it get up to that level? A minus, yeah. A minus, okay. Yeah, that does seem extraordinarily scary. I think there's going to be a lot of, like, sigh, you got me, <laughs> when people play that late in the game and sealed. Next is Charming Scoundrel. This is a one and a red for a 1-1 one, one human rogue at rare. It's got haste, and when it enters a battlefield, you can choose one of three options. Option one, discard a card, then draw a card. Option two is make a treasure. And option three is create a wicked roll token attached to target creature you control. And again, that's plus one, plus one, and when it dies your opponent yep. loses a life that's great yeah it, it's a solid b like yeah none of none of the modes when you choose them are fantastic like two mana two two haste wicked or two mana discard a card draw a card two mana make a treasure uh but the fact that you could choose between all of them yeah that makes this card always a good draw like yeah. there's not very many boards where you're going to be unhappy to see this card can't, can't imagine a board state where this doesn't do something relevant. B for Charming Scoundrel. Next is Food Fight. It's one in a red for an enchantment at rare. Artifacts you control have two. Sacrifice this artifact. It deals damage to any target equal to one plus the number of permanents named Food Fight you control. So this card obviously looks terrible. Awful. But, I mean, it is two sack of food deal two damage. It turns all your foods into shocks. Because it, so it deals one, one plus, and then plus your food fight. Because you have a food fight in play. So Okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. It's a little better than it looks. If it if it if it did one damage, I it would be stone F. Mm -hmm. I, as is, I think it's still probably a D, because like in order to make this good, you have to sack maybe three food to it. Cause you're down a card by casting this. Yeah. And it's not like food is a, a whole card by itself, but if you're playing a card that makes a food, you are like using some resources to make that food. So overall, I think that food fight's probably a D, but if you were like black green food and could make tons and tons of food, splashing this could be something you could consider, but how much better is it going to be to just play a sweet tooth witch and burn them out with a card that actually right. does something by itself? So right. yeah, you're not going to play this that often. I don't yeah. Think. D minus for food fight though. I I'm interested. Uh, next is raging battle mouse. This is uh, one and a red for a two, one mouse. <laughs> It's rare. This uh, The second spell you cast each turn costs one less to cast. That's interesting. And then it has celebration at the beginning of combat on your turn. If two or more non-land permanents enter the battlefield under your control this turn, target creature you control gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. This card's actually really good. That's like, pretty good. It, it operates a bit as a mana dork. And then, uh, you know, giving giving something plus one, plus one is also pretty sweet. Like, you, you just have this in play. You can easily sequence two spells. And then once you do, you end up in a spot where you get a, a little combat bonus. And so you're, you're getting a lot for two mana. Yeah. I'm not saying the card's a bomb, but I think I think it's a B. I think Raging Battlemouse is a card I'm pretty pretty happy to just put in my deck. Celebration payoff. Uh, next is Scalding Viper. This is one in a red for a 2-1 Elemental Snake. It's rare. And it says whenever uh, an opponent casts a spell with mana value 3 or less, this thing does one damage to that player. Okay. And then it's also a gold card of sorts. It's got a <laughs> blue adventure called Steam Clean. It's one and a blue for a sorcery. It says return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. 
I'm kind of weirded out by how many adventures are just weird bounce spells. There's just so many. It feels yeah, like. it is strange, isn't it? I don't really know what's up with that, but um, huh? The, this card is great. I would play it without the blue half, you know, very happily, because if you just have this in play, uh, you're it's a two mana two one that's going to nug your opponent for a couple damage over the course of the game. That's pretty awesome, and then. If you're blue red, I think it's like actively a great card because it's a bounce spell and a good aggressive creature. It just fits very nicely to a, an aggressive spells deck or even a defensive spells deck. Still finding that mm-hmm. too. So I would say it's a B in uh, blue red decks and like a B minus in uh, yeah in in just a, if you can only cast the red half. Yeah, both halves being cheap really helps a lot. Okay, um, Godric Cloaked Reveler is next. It's one red red for a 3-3 legendary human noble at rare. It's got haste, so three mana, three, three haste, and then it has celebration. If you have the two things happen, um, Godric Cloaked Reveler is a dragon with base power and toughness 4-4, four, four, flying, and red dragons you control get plus one, plus zero until end of turn. So it celebrates into a dragon. That's right? Yeah. And Every then, time you celebrate, it becomes a dragon. So Okay. Until and, and end of turn? Attack. Is that? Yeah. It, well, as long as two permanents have entered the battlefield this turn. So okay. Okay. just that what, what's going to happen is on their turn, it's immediately going to go back to not being a dragon until you celebrate again. <laughs> I mean, and it's already starting off as a three, three, three mana, three, three haste. Yeah, I so mean, three, mana, three, three awesome. haste as the floor is pretty great. And then this is the kind of card that finishes games really easily for the celebration deck, where you're just like play Godric. You know, maybe if even if you don't play them early, you just play it late, and then all of a sudden you you end up every time you celebrate that they just get hit for four or five or six in the air. And he still has haste, even if he's a dragon. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah that's Godric a sick looks celebration like an, payoff. Looks like an A minus to me. Just yeah. a really good aggressive card. I mean, your opponent plays this turn three, hits you for three. You kind of expect to be hit for four next turn a lot Minimum. of the time. Minimum. And if this is even if this is sitting in play and they haven't hit you for a turn or two, you you do feel like every turn that's probably going to happen. Right. And the fire breathing helps out a lot too, even though it's probably only going to do itself. All right. A for Godric Cloaked Reveler. Next is Kellen, the Fey Blooded. This is. Two and a red for a 2-2 two, two legendary human fairy, human fairy, at uh, Mythic Rare. It's got double strike, and it says other creatures you control get plus one, plus zero for each aura and equipment. Oh, really? Come on. Uh, attached to Kellen. I guess the auras part is relevant. Um, and then it's also got a white adventure called Birthright Boon, which is one and a white for a sorcery. Search your library for an aura or equipment card, reveal it, and put it in your hand, and then shuffle. Yeah. I mean, two and a red for a 2-2 two, two double strike, you kind of sold me there already. Mm-hmm. The rest is just a bonus, and it's not hard to give this a roll and give all your other creatures plus one, plus zero. Like, that I like is that pretty- it's built into the set. Yeah, because the equipment thing just still feels so forced. It, it does, and I don't think it matters too much if you have access to the, the white adventure part of this. Yeah. But... I think that uh, just as a double striker that can pump your whole team, Kellen's like a B, just a, a, yeah. a good card. You'd be happy to put in your deck. Like you said, two mana, two, two double strikes, a good floor already. Decadent Dragon is next. It's two red, red for a four, four dragon with flying and trample. And whenever it attacks, you create a treasure token. So that's, <laughs> All a, right. that's a good rare. Uh, it does have uh, another, an off color adventure. It is expensive taste, which is two and a black for an instant. And it says exile the top two cards of target opponent's library face down. You may look at and play those cards for as long as they remain exiled. Nice. This is one of the, those, you know, really pumped cards where you could 100% just play it in red. But if you happen to be able to either consistently cast expensive taste or even just splash for it, then great. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. You're- you're thrilled to to play it in your in your red deck, and if you have access to black mana, then yeah, cool, nice nice little bonus. Yeah, you get a potential three for one out of this card. Um, incredible. I mean, th- this is a very straightforward pushed rare. It is a regular rare, um, but yeah, I'd give it an A for Decadent Dragon. Yeah. Easy A. Nothing to con- 
complain about. Next is Imidane the Pyrohammer. And this is two red red for a 4-4 legendary human knight at rare. Whenever an instant or sorcery spell you control that targets only a single creature deals damage to that creature, Imidane deals that much damage to each opponent. So we're talking burn spells here? Yeah, I mean, it, you're, you're mostly talking uh, a four mana, four, four, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> every now and then it, it, it means you get double duty out of uh, your burn spells. I, I mean, this is a C. You just yeah. will put it in your deck as a four mana, four, four, and sometimes it'll ping your opponent for a little bit if you, you know, if you end up yeah. uh, burning one of their creatures, but yeah. I just don't think you care too much about that. We can up the ante to build around C plus for imitating the Pyro Hammer. Next is Red Cap Gutter Dweller. This is two red red for a 3-3 goblin warrior at rare. It's got menace. And when it enters the battlefield, you get two 1-1 rats that can't block. And at the beginning of your upkeep, you may sacrifice another creature. Hmm, what could it be? If you do, <laughs> put a plus one plus one counter on red, red cap gutter dweller and exile the top card of your library. What? You may play that card this turn? Oh my yeah, God. I mean, <laughs> this, this card means business. Like, Dude. You, you play this and it's like, all right, I get a three, three and two one ones then immediately it turns into a four, four and then it, and draws you a card and it threatens to do the same thing the next turn. Plus yeah. it has menace. So it's probably whacking your opponent. Uh, That's incredible. You know, while, while it's happening. Red cap gutter dweller is awesome. And you I've actually some, play cards? somehow played against this card like five times and I just wow. mostly have lost to it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I like a for red cap gutter dweller as well. Same. That's amazing. Virtue of courage is three red red for an enchantment. This is a mythic rare. And uh, it says, whenever a source you control deals non-combat damage to an opponent, you may exile that many cards from the top of your library. You may play those cards this turn. Again, non-combat, so burn spells basically. And then it has Embereth Blaze, which is one and a red for an instant, and it says it deals two damage to any target. These are interesting, I mean, you know, again, we're forced to kind of look at the adventure first, right, as kind of the main thing. What's what's kind of the joke here, though? Because this is numerous of these cards, the virtues, but also others. They want you to do both, but you can't. Like, is it for constructed because you're going to put four virtue of courage in a deck or something? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that I think that this cycle was a little bit more aimed at constructed than limited okay. in general. Yeah, um, I'm not really least, complaining. These are fine cards. It's just a little like you want both. Yeah, well, it's mostly the 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 red, blue, and green ones. The the enchantment side of it do, doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. So so you do have to you know keep that in mind. the The difference between this one and the blue and the green ones is, yeah, you probably should put one in a red instant, deal two damage to any target in your deck. Like yeah. Not not a wonderful card, but it's just you should you should play it like yeah. it, it seems fine to do so. You know, I agree. I mean, that's a C plus level card, and I guess in some crazy world, you cast Virtue of Courage at some point and do something with it. But that's going to be very very difficult to pull off. So I would still just say C plus for Virtue of Courage. Yeah, I like that. Uh, last red card is called Realm Scorcher Hellkite. Good name. Four red red. For a 4-6 dragon at Mythic, it's got Bargain. It's got a lot more than that. It's got Flying and Haste. And when it enters the battlefield, if it was Bargained, add four mana in any combination of colors. And you can pay one in a red to have it one deal one damage to any target. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I guess it's Mythic and it's a dragon, so go crazy. And they did. Oh, yeah. This, I mean, this card's absurd. This is also in the running for best card in the set. Like... Six mana, four, six flying haste that pings for two if you bargain it or does other things if you have better ways to spend the mana. Yeah. And if it sits in play, the the the, the pinging ability is just going to rack up the wins. Yes. Everything about this card racks up the wins. Yes, that's an easy A. That that This is an A plus probably. <clears throat> four, six flying. Because, you know, again, when, when we start talking A plus, we're either talking about over the top power level or the ability to stabilize a board in which you were behind and either bring you to parity or even maybe put you a bit ahead. And a four, six flying blocker that could kill one or, you know, a small creature without any extra mana investment um, definitely fits the bill for that. And then of course, if, if the board is stable or if you're ahead, this thing just slams the door on the game immediately. So I like A plus for Realm Scorcher Hellkite. No argument here. All right, that moves us to gold. Our first gold card is called Will. 
It's just good old Will. Scion of Peace. This is one blue white for a 2 4 legendary human wizard at Mythic Rare. It's got Vigilance, and you can tap it, and it says spells you cast this turn that are white and or blue cost X less to cast, where X is the amount of life you gained this turn, and you can only activate this ability at sorcery speed. How do you it, feel about it, three mana, two, four vigilance? C minus. Yeah, like, mediocre. But, and, and the ability here basically does nothing. So, right. so C, C minus yep. for will. Uh, next is Hilda of the Icy Crown. This is two blue white for a three, four legendary human warlock. This is also a mythic, or this one's a mythic. Uh, whenever, and it's a three, four. So four mana, three, four. Whenever you tap an untapped creature and opponent controls, you may pay one. When you do, Choose one. You can make a 4-4 four, four white and blue elemental creature token. Yeah. Like, just literally like make a 4-4. Four, four. Or you can put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. <laughs> yeah. Or you can scry two and then draw a card. Good lord. What a payoff for the tapper deck. Yeah. I mean, That's this, insane. This <laughs> yeah. This card is, is really something else. Like, I don't think the tapper deck's actually that good, but I mm-hmm. would just always take this card and then just put a couple tap effects and that that's it. You know, you don't yeah. have to you don't need a tapper deck, you just need Hilda of the Icy Crown. Right. And you tap you 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 get to pay the extra one for this once and you're way ahead. I mean, period. Yeah. I mean, you just you probably just make a four four in your set. Yeah. If if you have enough creatures in play, a plus one plus one counter might be more than four four, and that would be great too. And if those somehow aren't what you want, you scry two and draw a card and find your next tap ability. So what do you want to give it? I would give it an A. Okay. Like, the upside's it, there. It's okay. It's, I guess, technically a build around A in that if you put this in your deck and you can't activate it, it's just not going to do anything. Right. So, but there's a lot of support for this. If you open this, even in pack two, let's say you were blue, blue, red, because I frequently am, and you go pack two, uh, open up Hilda, you could splash for it with a couple effects. If you open it pack one, you could go bl- a little s- further into blue white and just take the, you know, the snare caster sprites and the, you know, tap scry one cards. You don't need very much. You just need a couple. Yeah. Cause we're aiming low. And of course, if you actually build around it, this card is just like an absurd bomb. Next is a uh, likeness looter. This is blue black for a one, one fairy shapeshifter. It's rare. It's got flying. You can tap it to draw a card and then discard a card. So they, they didn't screw that up. And then it says you can pay X and likeness looter becomes a copy of target creature card in your graveyard with mana value X, except it has flying and this ability. So you can change it again later. And then you can only do that at sorcery speed though. So you can't get the like combat blowout, but you can upgrade the likeness, likeness looter into whatever your best creature is in your graveyard. Yeah, I mean, two I mean you had me a two, yeah. <laughs> Go flying ahead. looter is already like yeah, pretty ha- something I'm pretty happy with. Definitely, the, the, this to me looks like a B plus. Um, I would already have it at B to B plus range for just the fly the one one flying looter. I don't know how powerful the other ability is. It's okay. Sorcery speed, you know, upgrade it. The truth is that a lot of times you're just happy to have this looter on the battlefield, and if you just get to keep looting, then that's good. One benefit I could see is if you can copy it into something with higher toughness, you know, you can get it out of range of some of the cheap burn spells or whatever that can nab a one toughness creature. That could help. Of course, you can turn it into some stupid bomb and just kill them. Yeah. It does lose <laughs> flying if the creature doesn't have flying, though, right? This is true. I, I suppose you'll have to have we to found, bear with that. We found that. something wrong with it. Yeah. Uh, do you want to go B plus or A minus on like this? Uh, I go B plus. It's okay. It's a good card in blue black. You know, you'll take a high. You're, you're not. It's not going to be a bomb. Frequently, it's rarely going to be the best card in your deck. Unlike the next card, actually, mm-hmm. uh, Ta- Talion the Kindly Lord is two blue black for a three four flying, legendary fairy noble, and uh, when as it enters the battlefield, you choose a number between one and ten. And whenever your opponent casts a spell with the mana value chosen or the power chosen or the toughness chosen, so any of the mana value, power, or toughness, they lose two life and you draw a card. Incredible. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, so basically this... 
when they play a spell, there's a good chance that this thing just is going to ping them mm-hmm. and you lo- they lose two life and you draw a card. It's in the dark, I would name three because okay. three and four are the most common uh, casting costs in, in most decks. Uh huh. And three is, I think, the most common power toughness for most decks. Okay. Uh, obviously, once you've played against your opponent, you're gonna you're gonna know a little bit more what they have going on. It's gonna be two or three, right? Like that's the sweet spot. There's some decks where you might want to name four, but yeah. Really? I'd be surprised. I, I think it's possible, but I think yeah, if you name two or three, you're gonna you're gonna end up. Uh, I would name three mostly, like unless you have a reason to think that two is better. How good is this card on there? Is it an A? This card's an A. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I don't know what the literal average number of cards in a deck that it stops, but it stops enough that I think that you're gonna you're gonna feel really good about about casting it, and it's just gonna like if it if it pings them twice, you've already way ahead. Even once, way, you're already way ahead. already way ahead. Probably just one already by that point. Yeah. Uh, before yeah. we go to Rowan, uh, Likeness Looter does keep flying, as Squirrel Loop pointed out. It keeps flying and the uh, ability to change into something else. So all oh, wow. the more Squirrel, upside. Squ- Squirrel's more useful than I thought. <laughs> Next is Rowan, Scion of War. This is one black red for a 4-2 legendary human wizard at Mythic Rare. It's got Menace, and it says, Tap, spells you cast this turn that are black and or red cost X less to cast, where X is the amount of life you lost this turn. Activate only as a sorcery. Yeah, this is the what? the 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 equivalent to to will. But I mean, how are you losing life on your turn? It, this these are just not for limited, basically. Okay, uh, so how about three mana four two menace? Is that for limited? Yeah, yeah, I would be happy to play that. I think that's so that's too. like a B. I mean, it's just a it's just a big. You know, a beater like your tough pill to swallow at mythic rare, <laughs> but it is, you know, that is a beater. Yeah. I like B minus for row and sign of war. Uh, next is Agatha of the vile cauldron. This is red green for a one, one legendary human warlock at mythic. It says activated abilities of creatures. You control costs X less to activate where X is Agatha of the vile cauldrons power. This effect can't reduce the mana cost to less than one mana, and it has an activated ability for green red. Creatures, other creatures you control get plus one plus one and trample and haste until end of turn. <laughs> haste. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, I don't. I, I kind of don't get putting haste on this, but yeah, you know, whatever. it feels like a why not, but whatever. Um, so two mana, one one. That's gold. Terrible. And it reduces activated abilities of creatures you control by one. Yeah. So that's terrible too. That's not, yeah, not and super relevant. Six mana to give your team plus one, plus one and trample is actually okay, but like doesn't come up that often. This card looks terrible to me. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think it's particularly good. Yeah. I would give Agatha of the Vile Cauldron a D. Yeah. I think that you would have to have a deck that could generate a lot of mana because the joke here is if you make Agatha into a three, three, mm-hmm. you can, you can activate it for cheap and then activate it for cheap. But like, that feels like a lot of setup. Yes. I like the, I like the idea, but I just don't see, I mean, it's also just a one, one. Uh, next is Yenna red tooth regent. This is two green, white for a four, four legendary elf noble at rare. And you can pay two mana and tap Yenna. And it says, choose target enchantment you control that doesn't have the same name as another permanent you control. Create a token that's a copy of it, except it isn't legendary. If the token is an aura, untap Yenna, Red Tooth Region, and then scry two, and then you can do all of this only at sorcery speed. Yeah. So it copies enchantments you control. Yeah, and you get one copy each time like you can't copy it more than once basically okay so what what am i copying that i'm excited about here um if i I copy a roll you 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 can copy a roll and then and then you get to cycle uh or you get to to scry to and you get to go again which is something it's not a lot 
It's not a lot, no, but it's something. Sorcery speed. I mean, I, I'm getting a four mana four four, which is okay. You know, that's a starting point. I, yeah, I guess four mana uh, four four mm-hmm. that gets you value two tap. Yeah, like copying a roll to scry two and give a plus one plus one on something isn't bad. Um, if you have other enchantments, like imagine you have the you know two mana make a knight enchantment or whatever. Like there's there's a couple other things that I think you would be not unhappy to 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 kind of copy. So if I have a roll on a creature and just that one roll, so I don't have the extra names thing, can I replace it on the same creature and knock off the other roll? Like if it was something that benefited from that. Uh, yeah. So so you could. You could you could make a copy on on a roll of a roll, and it would it would it would knock off the previous one. And if I wanted to put it on the same creature, could I can I choose where I put the new roll? Like yeah, it's like that's the whole like yeah. If you if you choose if you attach copy. it to wherever so, I want. So so you, you with Yenna in play, you could just I guess keep paying two to scry over and over again. Right, and scry two. Yeah, and there are payoffs for those rolls coming off. Sometimes you know some of the decks actually care about that. Yeah. I don't know. Th- th- this is a little confusing about like what the killer app is for Yenna, but you are getting a four mana four, four, and there is definitely some amount of upside here. So I would start off with B for Yenna red tooth regent. And yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if it like completely dominates some board states and then other board states, it's like, well, I got some power and toughness and it's not really doing much beyond that. Yeah. I can imagine games where you play this and it's like the most important card on the board. Right. Next is Ariette of the Charmed Apple. This is one black white for a 2-4 legendary human warlock. It is mythic rare. Each, each creature that's enchanted by an aura you control can't attack you or planeswalkers you control. And at the beginning of your end step, each opponent loses X life and you gain X life where X is the number of auras you control. This is Wicked Witch here. That's awesome. Yeah, this card's also really interesting because... Uh, it wants you to put a bunch of auras on their stuff, but if this goes away, all of a sudden those things are unlocked. Yes. So it can be kind of dangerous. So the cursed aura is kind of the key one, right? That's the joke. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the that's, thing. That's, that's the one you really want to. Yeah. You, you, you really want to do. But if you had other auras that you were able to target your opponent's creatures with, you could just pump them up, <laughs> but mean that they can't attack you anymore. And as long as you can keep Ariette on the battlefield, you're safe but your house of cards could come crashing down on you quite easily. Yeah, though most of the things that players' rolls don't let you put it on your opponent's creatures anyway. It's the rolls, but like if you had just straight up auras. Yeah, if you just t- if you just put an enchantment on right. your opponent's creature. So I don't know. I, I So starters, love this card. This is awesome. Like really cool design. Really, I get it. It's, it's great. How good is it though? Three mana, two fours, just kind of whatever. I mean, it does really grind them out. Like at the beginning of your end step, each opponent loses X life and you gain X life or, you know, like if you had two auras rolling on your opponent, like that would be great. You drain them for two. They can't attack you. Game really does become all about Ariette of the Charmed Apple at that point. Yeah. But and also don't ign- know. ignore the first line. Just mm-hmm. imagine playing this in a black white deck with a bunch of rolls where you're just She's just draining for two a turn because you have two rolls on your own creature. Like, that's still pretty good. Does that work, though? It's yeah. just the number of auras you control straight up. Yeah, it doesn't matter where they oh, are. That's so, really good. So I think most of what you're going to do with there yet is not going to be caring about the first line. It's going to be caring about, I have the wicked roll on one creature and, you know, the young hero roll on another, and you're draining, getting drained for two a turn. That's great. And I think that's going to be awesome. So can we go B plus on Ariat? You could easily go B plus. I mean, yeah. the, Ariette, much like Yenna, is I can imagine games where this is just the most important card in play. Yes. And if your opponent can't deal with Ariette, that they will lose the game very quickly. I like that both of those cards have four toughness as well. That makes it pretty tough to kill. Next is the Apprentice Folly. This is two blue red for a saga at rare. And chapters one and two are the same. It says choose target non-token creature you control that doesn't have the same name as a token you control. Create a token that's a copy of it, except it isn't legendary, is a reflection in addition to its other types, and has haste. You get to do that twice. And then chapter three, the fun ends, you sacrifice all reflections you control. So you get to copy stuff, but you kind of have to close out the game or get something out of it before uh, chapter three rolls around. Or bargain it away. Or and that's like the, that's the real combo. Oh, oh, 
Ooh. Yeah. It's just like the princess takes flight, which ended up being, I think a really awesome card. That mm-hmm. card's super powerful. This mm-hmm. is, this is similar. This isn't as good because this needs you because it's immediately chapter one, then two. If you only have one creature in play, when you cast this, you're going to copy it. And then on your next turn, you're not going to copy anything. Yeah, that's tough. So this is a two step thing, which is you have two creatures in play. You cast this. And then on your next turn, you bargain it away. But if you do, you spent four mana to clone two of your creatures. That's, of course, a huge win. Huge. And they have haste. Yeah. So I I would give The Apprentice's Folly a build around B. Okay. Where if you have, like, look, I found bargaining cards to be really strong. Like, we'll we'll talk more when we get to hatching plans on the bonus sheet. Mm -hmm. But uh, between, you know, Torch the Tower and Johan Stopgap, Tenacious Tome Seeker, Uncommon 3-2, like... A lot of really good cards have bargain that are good when you bargain and good when you don't. And just be setting it up with Freddy Apprentice's Folly to work, I don't think is going to be impossible. This isn't okay. going to be some pie in the sky thing. That okay. said, you can't just put it in a deck and expect it to work. You need to A, have like four or five bargain cards and B, have enough different creatures that you get to you get to copy. Though if you have a... Yeah, if you have two of the same creature in play and then you copy it, you can't copy it again because it doesn't care. It's, yeah, the way it works. So I think it's a builder on B, and I think not many decks are going to be able to use it. But if you see this like in pack three and you have two copies of Torch the Tower, a stopgap, a couple other, maybe two or more bargain cards, and you're you're a decently creature-heavy, you know, 12-creature, 13-creature deck, yeah, I would put this card in my deck. I think it would be good. But okay. that's just going to be... We're talking about a blue red card that's going to go in one out of five blue red decks. So, not a card you should be taking early, but the upside is there. And I like looking at the upside. I mean, part of doing well in draft is finding the upsides. Right. So, there you go. Build around BB plus for Apprentice Folly, but not for every blue red deck. Next is uh, Fonsbane, Fonsbane Troll, which is two black green for a 4 4 troll. It's rare. And when it enters the battlefield, you create a monster roll attached to it. So it's actually got plus one, plus one and trample. So it's a five, five trample for four. And then you can pay one and sacrifice an aura attached to it. And it fights target creature you don't control. If that creature would die this turn, exile it instead. And you can only do this fighting at sorcery speed. That's great. Nice. Yeah. I mean, really nice. Four mana, five, five trample <laughs> to start with. Yeah. And if you want... You know, you can just sack the aura to immediately fight something. Note that it's going to go down to a 4-4. Don't try to fight a 5-5. You, you will be uh, very unhappy if that if you do that. Right. <laughs> but I think that the the, the Fonsbane Troll looks like an A to me. Like, this me just looks like well, one of the cards you're going to be really hoping to take early. You could run it back, too. Like, it doesn't yeah. have to be that monster roll. You can totally. get another it, roll and punch something else. I mean, that's part of what makes it an A is that it turns all your role creation cards into fight spells. Like, right. That's huge. That's awesome. And it's a 4-4 base. Uh, next is the Goose Mother, which is kind of like Mother Goose. It is black, excuse me, a green-blue X for a 2-2 flying legendary bird hydra. <laughs> that's awesome. It's rare. Uh, the Goose Mother enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it. So you're getting a 2-2 flyer for two baseline, and then you can throw X at it to grow it. Um, when it enters the battlefield... Create half X food tokens, round it up. And then whenever the Goose Mother attacks, you may sacrifice the food. If you do, draw yourself a card. Oh, yeah. Sweet. This card's awesome. Also, it's a lot bigger than you think it is. It It's basically however much you spent is how big it is. So it's like a four mana four four. <laughs> like, yeah. We're like, flying. Dang. Yeah. And in that case, it would come with a food, which would then draw you a card. So how does I've, so create uh, half of X rounded up? Yeah, it's so rounded three up is on like one? Hydrid Crisis. No, three is two. Three uh, is on like two Hydrid Crisis, up, it right? rounds up. Oh wow! So which is pretty cool. Man, this is the goose that just keeps on giving. This thing's awesome. Yeah, no, the Goose Mother is real sweet. I uh, I've had this one a bunch somehow, and it's been it's been really really good. What grade would you give it? I'd give it an A. Yeah, like, it's. it's you know, it's anywhere from a three mana three three flyer to an eight mana eight eight flyer, and then the bigger you you know you make it, the more food you get. At which point, it draws you a bunch of cards, and like it just kind of does all the things you want it to do. So I can pay blue green two two flying, or I can pay blue green one three three flying, and I do get a food. Yeah, you would get a food in that in that case. Dang, that is sweet. 
All right, yeah, I love that card. Uh, next is Baluna Ground Squall. This is green, blue, red for a 4-4 legendary giant noble at Mythic Rare. It's got trample and permanent spells you cast that have an adventure cost, one less to cast. So if it's an adventure card and you're casting the non-adventure side, basically, it, it's cheaper. And it's a four man, a three mana four four trampler, but it is tough. It's three separate colors, and then it does. It is an adventure itself. It has seek thrills, which is two, and then a green blue red for an instant that says mill seven cards, then put all cards that have an adventure from among the milled cards into your hand. So interesting split here because you've got a clear adventure build around, but also you can just get a three mana four four trampler if you can actually cast the thing. Yeah. I don't know how to really break that down. I mean, these colors do produce a lot of adventure creatures, so it would be likely that you had some adventure cards in your deck regardless, even if you didn't like purposely build around the ground squall. I think the real question is, can you cast the thing? Yeah, and the thing is, the fact that it's a three mana four four trample really isn't real because you're not casting it on turn three very often. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes you'll be able to, but I don't think you're going to be super uh, into that. So like you're just not, you can't rely on it. So I think that the, the ground squall, I think that she's pretty good. If you can get the mana, right. The man that, that makes her almost a build around. Like, yeah, if you're a blue green deck with some good fixing and a bunch of adventures, it's going to be a very solid card. A lot of the times, this is just not going to be that good of a card. Yeah, I think you're just going to have to pay extra special attention to your mana with Balloon of Ground Squall. But if you can pull it off, we are talking about a B plus, A minus, whatever level card. Very, very strong. But you're going to probably have to leave it in the sideboard a lot of the time. Uh, yeah. Next are our artifacts. <laughs> First one is Agatha's Soul Cauldron. This is a mythic rare. It's two mana for a legendary artifact. And it says you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to activate abilities of creatures you control. So first question is, is casting an adventure an activated ability? And the answer is no, right? No, casting an adventure is not. So that doesn't fix your adventure problems. Okay, and it says creatures you control with plus one, plus one counters on them have all activated abilities of all creature cards exiled with Agatha, Agatha's Soul Cauldron. And you may wonder, well, how did that happen? Well, you can tap it to exile target card from a graveyard. When a creature card is exiled this way, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. So that's kind so, of the main thing, right? Yeah, I mean, at, at baseline, if you just ignored all the other text, two mana, tap, exile a card from a graveyard, and if it's a creature, put a plus one, plus one counter on one of your creatures, like, that's pretty good. I, I'm not going to be unhappy to, to just have this in play and every creature that dies turns into a counter on my team. Yeah, I want a little help with milling or killing or something, but... Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't put it in a, in a deck without creatures, but in a deck with that has a good amount of removal, has some creatures, seems fine. Okay. Now, the question is, what does the rest of us do? I don't really think it does that much, honestly. I, I don't know. Like, there's not that many creature-activated abilities. Like, Right. They, they really focused on adventure here. Yeah, it's going to have to, like, it's going to be once in a blue moon where there's a creature with an activated ability in a graveyard and you get to exile it and then make your, so your creatures can do something. I'm sure there's some that are decent. There's, like, it's going to be cool. I mean, there's going to be some really interesting stuff that happens, but that doesn't seem like the baseline. Yeah. I'm kind of low on this. I, I'm not that excited about the tap exile card from a graveyard thing. I, I don't think I would pay a card for that. <clears throat> I don't think and that how many you plus would one plus one either. counters do I need to get before I'm like, you, all right, it's like three. three? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I give get, Agatha's Soul Cauldron like a D. Yeah, I think that's. I think it's a little better than that, but I still think it's not very good. Okay. Um, next is Sir Ginger, the Meal Ender. <laughs> this is two mana for a three-one legendary artifact creature, Food Knight. It's rare. Sir Ginger has Trample, Hexproof, and Haste as long as an opponent controls a Planeswalker. All right. Whenever another artifact you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, put a plus one, plus one counter on Sir Ginger and Scry one. And of course, you can, well, okay, it's a little modified. You can pay two tap and sack Sir Ginger to gain life equal to its power. 
What? All right. So the planeswalker thing's like hardly relevant. What do we have? One or two or something in the whole thing? There's Ashiok. I think Just that's Ashiok, the only one. Yeah. And then, so, but you are getting a two mana three one. And if other artifact, if you sack food or whatever, you're getting plus and plus ones and scries on this guy. Yeah. Or girl. Dude, I don't know. Colorless I mean, two mana three one with some upside. I guess it's hard to hate that too much, right? Yeah, I mean that that part seems fine to me. Like you're you're gonna you're gonna grow when one of your food dies or something like that, or your ginger brood or or you sack a prism to bargain. Like in it, you can sack it to gain life. Like you should always put this card in your deck. I it's just so. not a not a bomb or anything. You wouldn't take this over, you know, a, a good removal spell. But it's right. still a fine card to put in your deck. A solid C plus for Sir Ginger the Meal Ender. Yeah, seems seems legit. Next is the Iron Crag. It's two mana for a legendary artifact at rare. It taps to add a colorless, and whenever a legendary creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may have it. You may have the Iron Crag become a legendary equipment artifact named Everflame Heroes Legacy. If you do, it gains equip three, and equip creature gets plus three plus three and loses all other abilities. So let's focus on the main thing here: two mana. For a mana rock that taps for a colorless. Are we in for that? Yeah, I think, I think a lot so. of decks so. are at the very least interested in it, even yeah. if it's not like a high priority. Right. There's a lot of mana to spend when, with adventures and stuff around. So I like that. And then what do you think about this? You know, you, you, you play a legend. Let's say you have one or two in your deck. You play one. And then if you want, you can make this thing into an equipment that adds a lot of power and toughness plus three plus three is huge but the equip cost is kind of a lot and then also it makes the thing lose all other abilities so that you know who knows if, if you're looking to beat down you probably don't care yeah but i mean it might lose trample or you know lifelink or something who knows D does it does this thing no, still no, no, tap no. for it, mana or it it doesn't it doesn't lose <laughs> the templating on this is just such garbage oh i missed my quotes didn't i Yes, you did. <laughs> this loses other abilities. I see. I'm stupid. Uh, okay. No, uh, you're not. It also the answers the question I was just going to ask, which is, can I still tap this thing for mana? And the answer is no. No. So basically, the reason I think this card is pretty good is you end up in a spot where you get to play a mana ramp card, and then uh, when you're done mana ramping at some point you're probably going to play a legend there's a lot of them and then you get to just turn this into a pretty sick equipment like in the late yeah. game this is this is a very very strong equipment like you're going to continue using it um can i is there a timing trick i can do mm, like i, I mean not, it, not really trigger goes on can i tap iron craig for mana and then use that mana to equip and still get the equip like the benefits. sure but you could just tap this to cast the legendary creature it's like not like the iron crag needs to be untapped or anything okay so i like this card i think i'm interested in a two mana mana rock enough to play it and then i actually think this equipment given that it only happens after you've kind of used the iron crag for mana a bunch of times and now it's something a little more relevant probably than the iron crag yeah and it's also a may so if you need the mana you can just say nah i'm good on the equipment I'm not yeah. super stoked. I would give it a C plus, but I, I think I would play it. it. It would make it in my deck some percentage of the time. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that that's about where I have it too. What about um, Hilda's Crown of Winter? What, what does that do? This card is insanely good. It's three mana, legendary artifact at rare, one tap, tap target creature. This ability costs one less to activate during your turn. So on your own turn, it's just tap, tap target creature. Wow. On their turn, it's an icy. And then it also has the ability of three, sacrifice it. This doesn't require tapping, by the way. Three, sacrifice Hilda's Crown of Winter. Draw a card for each tap creature your opponent controls. Holy smokes. So I think this card would be like an A- minus with only the ability one tap, tap target creature. But they added two extra upsides, which is it's free on your turn. And you at some point can cash this in to draw two, three, maybe four cards, depending on how many tap creatures they have. That's, That's like a pretty ridiculous set of upsides. The only thing I don't like about it is that like, I, I never want to let it go. Like I don't want to catch it in, you know, I just want to keep tapping their stuff down. Yeah. I mean, it's not that a downside. It, it's just emotional. Yeah. I think that this card, it's colorless too. Like you should basically just 
take this card and play it no, no matter what. Yeah. Like, and it being colorless is just insane. Um, what grade? Is it a B plus? Is an A minus? A plus? Yeah, sure. It's a colorless card that's always going to be awesome. Like yeah. you should, yeah. you know, you're, you're, you're just, cheap. that's just, that's just where, what I'm, what I'm in for. Wow. That card's stupid. Uh, awesome. Um, all right. And then there's a cycle of creature lands here. Is that what we've got? Mm -hmm. All right. The first one is the black white. So these are enemy colors. Uh, they're all yeah. rare. So I'm, I'm just going to, so I'm going to tell you what they all do and then we'll read the parts that are different. So they're all rare. They're all lands. They all enter the battlefield tapped and they all tap for one of two colors of mana. This one is a black white. And then they have these activated abilities. This one is two black white. And it says, Restless Forces becomes a 1-4 white and black nightmare creature token until end of turn that's still a land. And then whenever Restless, Forces, Rest, uh, Restless Fortress attacks, defending player loses two life and you gain two life. Dang. All right, let me read all of them and we'll kind of go back through and see what we like. Restless Spire is the blue-red one. And you can pay just blue-red to turn it into a 2-1 blue and red elemental creature token with as long as it's your turn, this creature has first strike, and then it, whenever it attacks, you scry one. Then Restless Cottage is the black-green version. You can pay two black-green to have it become a 4-4 black and green horror creature until end of turn that's still a land, that whenever it attacks, you get a food token and exile up to one target card from a graveyard. Then there's Restless Bivouac, which is the white-red version. You can pay one white-red to have it become a 2-2 two, two red and white ox uh, that's still land, of course. And whenever it attacks, you put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. And then there's Restless Vinestock, which is the blue-green version. This one costs five mana, three blue-green, and it becomes a 5-5 five, five green and blue plant creature with trample. And whenever that thing attacks... Up to one other target creature has base power and toughness 3-3 three, three until end of turn. Wow, these are powerful. So these are all basically B plus, A minus level cards. They're, I actually think they're all about the same. These like, are insane. Like, I guess if I had to say which one was the best, I, I don't even know, the blue-green one maybe, but like, they're all just crazy good. Um, maybe the blue-red one's the worst because it's the smallest. But for mm -hmm. the most part, you should just, if you're any combination of these colors you you should you should take these and be very happy playing them they fix your mana and they add a really strong kind of effect to the to the rest of the game that's right wow that's insane yeah so only one of them costs two mana and one of them costs five and then the rest are either four or three i assume yeah. these these other cards are fake right yeah I the rest of those cards are fake okay so that means that we will now go to the bonus sheet this mm -hmm. is something that we're we love uh, when they do these bonus sheets. They're really cool. We're going to kind of cruise through these. Um, you know, you will see these drafted and draft out. They are important, but there are some that are, are kind of misses, I get, you know, for, for the limited format, but uh, some that aren't. So let's go. First one is, I'm going to just start with white, is land tax, which is white for an enchantment. This one is a mythic. They, these come in three rarities, by the way, for the bonus sheet. They're, they're uncommon, rare, or mythic. This one's mythic. It's an enchantment for white. And it says, at the beginning of your upkeep, if an opponent controls more lands than you, you may search your library for up to three basic land cards, reveal them, put them in your hand, and then shuffle. So, what do you think about land tax in, like, just a modern era limited set? So I haven't, I haven't tried it yet, mm -hmm. but I think what I would do with this is, if I was playing best of three, I would want this in my deck on the draw. The thing is... If you have this in your opening hand and you're going second, it's actually pretty good. Because imagine the game plan. Your opponent plays a, a land, says go, and you go planes, land tax, go. Yep. So now what do they do? Right. If if they play if they if they play a land, you get to search your library for up to three basic lands. You probably don't even get the full three, so you don't have to discard. Though maybe you do because it's within your deck, I guess. Mm-hmm. And then next turn, they're probably going to play another land and you're going to get to do it again. And you're going to end up in a spot where you're able to basically pay a one mana spell to draw three or four or five lands off of it. Right. Which is pretty powerful. Yeah. Especially if you can do something with the extra cards in hand, like discard them and stuff. This sets a little more set up towards bargaining, which doesn't care about that. Yeah. Um, you can get any basics you want. I don't know. It, there's also, of course, the situations where you draw it later and it kind of doesn't do much. 
it totally is a blank if you draw it like middle or late game, unless uh, unless you're bargaining, which is, a, is is real upside. Or you sneak it out on turn four when you have four lands in play and they have five or something. Yeah, and you you know you're going to hit. I, I don't think I want this in my hand or deck on the play. I just I just uh, I'm worried that I would draw this card and it would just be completely terrible you know yeah i agree i i'm gonna start off low on even though it is a historically very powerful card generally speaking it's really excelled in decks that can take advantage of having material in hand like they, they are just lands but when you can discard them when you can loot them away when you can turn them into something else freely that's where this card is just absurd it is good to just thin your deck and hit a bunch of land drops, but you have to set it up, set it up perfectly. If you're playing best of one, I mean, you don't know if you're going first. So I, you know, yeah. I would lower it too. I would start off on D for land tax. It's just a little too situational, I think, but I don't know. Probably will lose to it a few times too. What do you think? Yeah, that, that sounds about right to me. I, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. I have to this is one that's a little confusing. My guess is you should probably, you are more likely to be right if you just don't play this card, but yeah. I mean, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Next is Blind Obedience. This is one in a white for an enchantment at rare, and it's got Extort, which is whenever you cast a spell, you can pay either a white or a black mana, and if you do, each opponent loses a life, and you gain that much life. And then it says, Artifacts and Creatures your opponents control enter the battlefield tapped. This card's this card really is good at being annoying. It's just a really good card, I think. Mm. Like, basically, Extort is such a strong ability, especially in this set because of Adventures, where each Adventure card counts as two spells, basically. Oh, There's a yeah. lot of cantrips. Like, I've actually played this card twice somehow, and and it's been it's been nuts both times. Okay. Like, I believe it. it it's just, a, I think, a very strong card. Uh, B plus for Blind Obedience? Is it an A? I don't know. You played I it. Give, I haven't yet. I would. I would give it a B plus. Like, okay. I don't think it's an A, but I think it's. I think it's quite strong. Like, and their creatures coming to play tap messes up their haste creatures. They can't sack their food right away. Like you, you know, they, they can't block. Like all those things add up pretty nicely. Dawn of Hope is next. This is one in a white for an enchantment at rare. Whenever you gain life, you may pay two if you do draw a card. And then it has an activated ability. You can pay three in a white to make a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token with lifelink. This one is a little slow. It's and clunky. by a little it's slow, I mean both a ends. lot of slow. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, like, very, it's very slow. But man, it does take over. It is It is quite strong if you can, if you can, get, it, if you can get it going. Like... I think that this is probably too slow. My experience with it the last time we saw this was it didn't really work. And I think that this, this, I just don't see why this would be super different, you know? Super man intensive, but it so, does feed itself and get rolling, but it is, it is a little too slow. I would say C minus for Dawn of Hope. I think if you can produce a deck that makes a bunch of extra mana, then it can take over. But on a normal deck, it's a little too slow. I agree. Uh, Greater Oromancy is one and a white for an enchantment at Mythic. Other enchantments you control have Shroud, which means they can't be targeted by anybody. And enchanted creatures you control also have Shroud. I can't imagine this is worth a card, right? No, I don't think it is. It, it It's just way too fiddly to get going. I don't yeah. think that you're going to want to do that. I would, give, I would give Greater Oromancy an F. I just don't think it's worth a card. Next is Griffin Airy. This is one and a white for an enchantment. This one's an uncommon. It says at the beginning of your end step, if you gained three or more life this turn, create a 2-2 white griffin creature token with flying. It's a tough one, man. I mean, you, you can get that going, but three life is a lot, right? It's the food synergy is kind of the thing, but I mean, that is a lot. Yeah, I, I don't think that this card is very functional. It's just really hard to actually have this work. And if you had a food-centric deck, would you play it? Yeah, I mean, I would try to, but I just mm -hmm. don't. I don't think. I don't think it's very likely to 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 be functional. Build around B for Griffinary. I think it's like a build around B, but I've tried it twice, and neither time has worked out. So okay, that's you, that's you, tough. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you 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 can you can take from that what you will, I suppose. There you go. Next is intangible virtue. By the way, I should mention these are all enchantments. The the whole yeah. sheet. Um, the whole bonus sheet. Yes. The whole sheet. Yep. Yeah. Uh, intangible virtue is one and a white for an enchantment and uncommon creature tokens you control get plus one plus one and have vigilance. 
This is a build around uh, like B plus. Yeah. Like if you can if you can play this in the rat deck and and do a good job. I actually kind of like this more than the than the pollen hair. Mm. The reason being that uh, you you can't really. It's going to be harder for your opponent to kill this than to kill it two two. So you can right. actually build around this and and be be pretty happy with the results. I, I think that you're not going to run this very often, but in the right deck, it's really good. All your rats are two twos is just a strong ability. So. I think build around B plus is where I'd land on intangible virtue and look to be probably black white, but maybe red white. Red, red's rat creating cards, I think, are a little bit worse. Okay. Uh, next is rest in peace. This is one and a white for an enchantment. It's rare. When it enters a battlefield, exile all graveyards, and if a card or token would be put into a graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. Not gonna not gonna fit for this set really, right? No, I think this is an F. You're just yeah. not you're never gonna play this. There's a couple things it does, but it wouldn't be worth a card. Next is Grasp of Fate, one white white for an enchantment at Uncommon. When Grasp of Grasp of Fate enters a battlefield for each opponent, exile up to one target non-land permanent that player controls until Grasp of Fate leaves the battlefield. So it's basically an oblivion ring, mm-hmm. but for one white white, which that almost takes it from like I mean it's a B still, but it kind of almost makes me want to give it a B minus. Mm-hmm. Just <laughs> Being hard to cast is being hard to cast, you know? It matters. And, it does. But this is a good removal spell. I'd play yeah. it in any white deck. Yeah. B, B, B minus for Grasp of Fate. Next is Karmic Justice. This is two and a white for an enchantment at rare. It says, whenever a spell or ability an opponent controls destroys a non-creature permanent you control, you may destroy target permanent that opponent controls. Ah, come on. I don't think this is no. like that I was trying to think often. like would you side this in if you were playing against someone who had like a ton of kill spells but it it doesn't work on minus 3 minus 3s it doesn't work on damage it literally has to destroy and it doesn't work on creatures right yes <laughs> destroys a non creature permanent so I'm like oh you, you know you're bringing in your naturalized well watch this <laughs> No, I, I think the only justice that would be served for is you losing for having played Karmic Justice. So let's give that one an F. Next is Frexian Unlife. This is two and a white for an enchantment at rare. You don't lose the game for having zero or less life. As long as you have zero or less life, all damage is dealt to you as though the source had infect. And infect um, means the damage is dealt to you is dealt via poison counters. And if you get 10 of those, you lose the game. This is kind of like a, a way to gain a bunch of extra life. Uh, 10-ish life. 10-ish life, but I don't really think that it's like a functional way to do that. So no. I, I would not play Frexian on life. I hope there's a cool combo with it, but just game in and game out, it looks like an F to me. Uh, next is Leyline of Sanctity. This is two white white for an enchantment at rare. Uh, if it's in your opening hand, you can begin the game with it on the battlefield. You don't even have to pay the cost. Um, it gives you Hexproof, which unfortunately is not worth a card. Yeah. So I would not play Leyline of Sanctity unless maybe there's some sideboard situation where it could be relevant that I don't know about yet. Uh, next is Smothering Tithe. This is three and a uh, three and a white for an enchantment at Mythic. Whenever an opponent draws a card, that player may pay two. If that player doesn't, you create a treasure token. So is four mana to basically make them pay two a turn. Plus, if they're playing a deck with card draw, they even have to pay a little bit more. But they could, A, just pay the two, and B, they could just choose not to pay the two. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> And you're already at four mana. Yeah, so I don't know. I'm not... I'm not I'm not I'm not stoked about the the idea here. No, people like this card in multiplayer because it's whenever any opponent does it, so it kind of you can come back with three or four treasures or something, but but not here. Also, I like this art better. The other one was where the guy was like barfing up the coins, right? Yeah, that yeah, that one was that sweet. Was brutal. <laughs> uh, Knightly Valor is our last white from the bonus sheet. It's four and a white for an enchantment. It's an aura. And it's uncommon and a chance a creature. And when it enters the battlefield, you get a 2-2 white knight creature token with vigilance. And the creature that this thing's on gets plus two, plus two, and vigilance. This is a swingy card, right? If you stick knightly valor, it changes the board significantly in your favor. But yeah, if, I, they, if they kill your creature or bounce it out from underneath, then you just spent five mana. <laughs> and you're probably just going to lose the game. And no, you don't get the 2-2 if that happens either. So you just lose all of it. Yeah, I I think that Knightly Valor is pretty good. It's a strong card. It's a lot of power and toughness and two permanents and an enchantment. 
and like also like half of it has uh, vigilance or sorry half of it has haste and all of it has vigilance like you, yes. you get you get to do a lot with this card it almost always opens up an attack that you didn't have prior and a great blocker being left back plus the token it is a huge swing if you can play it i think it's worth it it's just you have to be careful about timing it. There's some decks that you kind of don't want it against. You're playing against blue, black or something. It's pretty scary. But, you know, this is the kind of card that can catch you up against like a quick red green start or something like that, where like you stabilize the board and take the initiative. Not not that initiative, but <laughs> you take the <laughs> a- attacking back and start slamming. I, you know, I would give Knightly Valor a B minus, but you have to be careful. The, the downside is very, very, like you will lose the game if you go for Knightly Valor and they kill your creature. Your, your win percentage just dumps off. But if you stick it, it goes up quite a bit. It's just not that hard to play a game of limited where you don't play this one. They have a bunch of mana on top. Right. Like, you can find a window for it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that, uh, yeah, I think that Knightly Valor is pretty awesome. Like, um, I, yeah. I would give it a B. Yeah. I like B for Knightly Valor. Just B. Careful. And the curiosity is our first blue card. It is blue for an aura. Uh, it is uncommon. It enchants a creature. And when the enchanted creature deals damage to an opponent, you may draw a card. This is a, a, a nice little build around. The, the one deck where I think you might want it is blue black fairies. When you have uh, a bunch of like one mana, one, one flyers, like yeah. there's the, there's the one, the uncommon surveil one, one flyer. There's the common one, one flyer that taps something Turn one, one, one flyer, turn two curiosity. If they don't have a removal spell, you do win the game on pretty short order there. Yeah. Curiosity is a powerful, you know, we were talking about getting knightly valor through at five mana. Well, curiosity is real easy to get through. And once you get the card back, you feel like, okay, I'm even. And now if this thing gets to hit you again, I'm going to start generating serious card advantage. And there are rare games where they do happen where curiosity can run away with the game too. What grade would you give it? Like C plus, B minus? I think it's, I think it's a build around. You just only mm-hmm. are going to put it in a specific deck. It's a build around B. If you have like two or three one mana one one flyers and a couple more cheap flyers, like Barrow Naughty is also great with it. Mm-hmm. Like the one three is actually pretty hard to kill. Then I would, then I would, I would be pretty happy to put this card in my deck, but otherwise I'm, I'm not interested in it. Next is Compulsion. It's one in a blue for an enchantment. It's uncommon. It has two activated abilities. You can pay one in a blue to discard a card and then draw a card, or you can pay one in a blue to sacrifice the Compulsion and draw a card. I don't Would really like either this, of those. This card was a bomb in Odyssey Limited. Is, was it really? Well, that was a format around Threshold and Madness, and ah. Limited used to be so much slower, and you had so many more worse cards. You you can't do this anymore. No. It's an F. Like, no, you just can't. Just Hatching Plans is next. It's one and a blue for an enchantment and uncommon. When it is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, draw <clears throat> three cards. I love it. Bargain it away I, for three extra cards. I actually think this card is great. I think it, I think it's, this card's like a B plus straight up. Like straight up, straight up. I How mean, can it be straight up? <laughs> I think that this this format lends itself to it where. You can take this card early and mm-hmm. you will get there. Like you're not, okay. I don't think, I don't think this is like, oh, let's see if this isn't like taking Griffin Airy and being like, all right, let's see if I can build a life gain deck. It's like, oh, I took a hatching plans. Let me just make sure I get my four or five bargain cards. Okay. And, and I think you're just going to get there. Like it's not hard to get there. Such a huge upside. You get to bargain away, you get the extra benefit and then you get the three cards as well. So what, what grade would you give it? What build around grade would you give it? Because you have to have bargain cards in your deck or it doesn't do anything. I mean, it's it's basically like I think it's a build around like a build around like, you know, B plus. I, okay. I would just call it a B plus. I just think that the card works. You just think there's that much bargain that you can just draft normally, not even consider that you have hatching plans in your well, deck, and then you're just gonna magically come up with I don't know about not consider, but like you don't have to like go deeply out of your it's way to make this build work. around on the level that some of our build arounds are. It's more like right. just That's check kind the of box. What I'm I got you. That's awesome. I love that. Next is another man. These are some classics. Spreading seas, one in a blue oh, yeah. for an enchantment aura. It's uncommon and enchants a land. And when it ETBs, you draw a card, and the enchanted land is an island. <laughs> this card is savage. It's remember when. People played it against Jund, and then people yeah. started sideboarding <laughs> Jace the Mind Sculptor against them, <laughs> and then they would cast it off of the spreading seized lands. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I mean, this card just like 
sometimes you're on the play, you go island, they go swamp go, and you go spreading seas, and they're like, oh, I can't cast spells anymore. Yeah, it, it like, actually happens like that. It's really funny. And it is low low downside. I mean, you, you play it, you, you pay two mana, you get your card back. Yeah, I mean, part of what's funny about this card is uh, this is the perfect place to put it. It's actually a really good bonus sheet selection because – because of bargain yeah. and aura build arounds and stuff like that, it it's actually like this is this is where you'd want spreading seeds to to live. Like it makes sense. Yes, I, I like this card. I actually take this card fairly fairly highly. Like it's it's fuel for your bargain stuff. It can randomly mana screw your opponent. Like overall, it it just kind of works and does more than it looks like it'll do. Definitely. I, and, and like you said, the bar, you get the card when it ATBs and then you can bargain it away later and you might screw up your opponent's mana. There's just, it's all like kind of low floor, low ceiling, but it like, it all works. These are all things that you want and you're only paying two mana. What would you give it? Like a C plus? Yeah, I'd give it a C plus. Like I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not sitting here saying like it's, it's like an amazing card or whatever. As foretold is two and a blue for an enchantment at rare at the beginning of your upkeep, put a time counter on as foretold once each turn, you may pay zero rather than paying the mana cost for a spell you cast with mana value X or less where X is the number of time counters on as foretold. Can we just say no? No, this is an F. I don't okay. think this one works. Copy enchantment is next and it better do what I think it does. Uh, Two and a blue for an enchantment. You may have copy enchantment enter the battlefield as a copy of tar of any enchantment on the battlefield. It does do what I thought it did. Yeah, it does exactly what's advertised. I, yep. I don't think this card is actually functional. Like no, most of the enchantments, mana. most of the enchantments that you want to copy are just are that you can copy are just bad. There's not that very many actual good ones. I think this is pretty much an F. Like. Yeah, it just doesn't seem like it'd be worth putting in your deck. Next is Frayne Sanity. This is two and a blue for an enchantment or a curse at rare. Enchant player at the beginning of each end step, enchanted player mills X cards where X is the number of cards put into their graveyard from anywhere this turn. This turbo mills, but you have to have like other you, ways to get. Yeah, you, you got to get it started. I, I don't think yeah. that this one this one works either. No, I don't think so either. This is a build around F. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> next is intruder alarm. It's two and a blue for an enchantment at rare. Creatures don't untap during their controllers. Untap steps. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield, untap all creatures. This affects every creature, right? Yeah, so no creature untaps, but every time a creature comes in, they all untap. Another F. This <laughs> it's just I, I don't really don't really know how to break the symmetry on this one. Or no, what you're I, I to don't, do don't be suck, uh, stuck being the sucker who's the one playing the intruder alarm. Next is Ristic Study. This is two and a blue for an enchantment at Mythic. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, you may draw a card unless that pay player pays one. It is annoying. Yeah, so this, I mean, compare this to Stone Rain. Mm -hmm. This basically destroys one of their lands because every time, you know, they play a spell, they have to play one. But the, the difference is they can just choose not to pay the one if they right. really don't want to. Right. I mean, if you play this on turn three, it does impact the game. Like M Modern Era Limited is about curving out. It is about using up all your mana every turn. Those are things that you see all the time in high level limited. I, I'm just hesitant because late game, this, this card starts to really get bad. If you do play it on turn three and your opponent is beating you down, they may just say, okay, have some cards, but you're taking a crap ton of damage for it. And you just play this three drop that didn't do anything else. They also yeah. just may play a two or a three on their turn and, and pay the cost. I think I'm down on Ristic study. I, I, I would categorize it as annoying but not necessarily like bomby or super powerful. Look, if it either made it so you drew a card whenever they played a spell, that'd be busted. Or their spells cost one less, that'd also be busted. The fact that they get to choose means it's just really not like. Yeah. I don't I, think I so. Think, I don't think that you. I don't think that you should put this card in your deck. I think it's an F. Much like Leyland of Anticipation, the next yes. card, mm -hmm. which starts in play if you have it in your opening hand, and it makes it so all your spells have flash. Just not good. Can't not spend it. a card on it. Right. What uh, about Kindred Discovery? It's three blue blue enchantment at Mythic Rare. As it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Whenever a creature you control of the chosen type enters the battlefield or attacks, draw a card. So 
you basically choose whatever type you have the most of, or in the case of rats, you can choose rats and then, uh, you know, whenever you make a rat or, or attack with a rat, you draw a card. It's risky though, cause it's not optional. I could see a rat deck actually decking itself if, mm. if it goes too deep. Also, you're spending five mana on this. This looks like a build around D to me where you not only have to spend five mana, you then have, you then get to start drawing cards, which is not really where you want to be. And sometimes you won't have the right creatures or they deal with your creature and sometimes you'll have too many of the creature and now you can't actually make use of it. It just feels like how much, how often is this going to be better than the, than, you know, before the fake court five mana, draw three, put a one, one flying token into play. Yeah. Like, that is so much more solid. The other, obviously this one has this insane upside, but I would not be excited to play Kindred discovery. I, no. it's just too costly you know, to pay five mana and not get much out of it. What about Forced Fruition? <laughs> I remember this card. It says four blue blues and enchantment. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, that player draws seven cards. So what basically that does is it means that your opponent gets to cast like two to four more spells before they get decked. Mm -hmm. Kind of interesting. I actually think that there's matchups where this card's awesome. You play Definitely. in the blue mirror and you land it when they have 20 cards in their deck, they're probably dead. Yes. The downside is it's a six mana spell that if you play against an aggro deck, you're going to play it. They're going to play a spell, draw seven, play another spell, draw seven. You're going to be dead. Yes. It's like you spent six mana on nothing. And this is a format where some people do have enchantment removal. Can you imagine playing this? And then the first thing they do is blow it up. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, that's tough. So where does it land? Because I love this card. <laughs> Right. It is so sweet to be like, go ahead. And then they're, you know, squirming, looking at their hand. Is I it just terrible that, or? I think it's probably more terrible than not. Like <sighs> I, I bet, I bet in sealed actually specifically, this is a bomb. Yeah. Like I bet, I bet in sealed, you can just aim to play this in the middle of the game and like put your opponent in a real, real tough spot because mm -hmm. people have slower decks. I think in limited, in draft rather, you should just not put this card in your deck. Oh, so heartbreaking. Same with the last one, Omniscience. This is seven blue, blue, blue for an enchantment. It makes uh, spells you cast from your hand free, but it costs 10 mana. Yeah, so, can't there, spend 10 mana on anything. That moves us to black, which is Vampiric Rites. Uh, black for an enchantment and uncommon, and you can pay one and a black and sacrifice a creature to gain a life and draw a card. You know, this type of card that can do some work in like sacrifice, heavy sacrifice themes, which we don't really have here. Is it just a rat factory or what, what is this thing? Yeah, playing it with rats. There's a couple threatens that you could combine with this, but this costs two, so it's a little clunky. Like you play with the Ariat's Poisoned Apple or uh, the, the Swear Fealty card. I think that... I think that Vampiric Rites is is like a build around like C. Yeah. I had one deck where like if I wield it, I thought I might try and play it, but I didn't wield it, so I never found out. I think in a heavy rat deck, you might be able to make it work. I like uh, one that we're going to get to, Goblin of Awardment, a lot better for the okay. rat deck, but mm -hmm. Vampiric Rites is similar. My guess is it's like on the on the low side, but you, you never know. Okay. Uh, next is a, a real house, Bitter Blossom, one in a black. Oh, yeah. For a tribal enchantment, Fairy, this is a mythic rare, and at the beginning of your upkeep, you lose one life, and you get a 1-1 one, one black fairy rogue creature token with flying. This is a goat tier limited card. Yeah, I mean, if your opponent plays this on turn two, you're probably just dead. They're, like, they're yeah. going to make six tokens over the course of the game. Also, this card's even better because you can bargain it away if you get to like five lives. That's incredible. Which is, which is gross. Yeah. <laughs> it would be fine even if you couldn't. But yeah, Bitter Blossom's an A. If you see it, you just want to slam it. Yep. I will say it's not a very good splash. Casting this on turn six is not as effective as casting it earlier. Yeah. But, you know, that is it is what it is. But like he said, if you do, you win. Uh, Oversold Cemetery is one and a black for an enchantment at rare. At the beginning of your upkeep, if you have four or more creature cards in your graveyard, you may return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. This one's hard to get to work, but once you do, I think it, I think it's pretty rewarding. Like... If you have four creatures in your graveyard and your or like you know and your opponent is thinking about attacking you, they're like, well, if I attack you, you're just going to get to chump and get a creature back. So that's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. So the the question is, how do you get it kick started? There's not that much like self mill stuff. Yeah, it looks like a build around C to me, where I could see trying to uh, 
you know, kind of work your your deck such that you have tons and tons of creatures, but that seems like it's not going to happen very often. No. Or you side it in an attrition matchup. Like, you imagine black-green versus red-black, and, you know, the games go long, you both have a lot of removal, and you cast this. It seems like it could be kind of a bomb. Yeah. It's just hard because, you know, once you start bringing them out, then you might be below that threshold, and then you can't anymore. True. I, I like what you said, though. Build around C. Waste Not is next. It's one and a black for an enchantment at rare. Whenever an opponent discards a creature card, you get a 2-2 black zombie token. Whenever an opponent discards a land card, you get two black mana. And whenever an opponent discards a non-creature, non-land card, you draw a card. So what's the, is there any consistent discarding happening here that you could side this in or something? Yeah, I don't there, really there know. There just isn't, right? There's not, a, like, basically for you to get your card back out of this, you would need to make, like, two zombies and draw a card or something like that, because mm -hmm. that makes up for the times when you cast this and it does nothing. Right. And when they discard lands, adding two blacks often going to do nothing as well. So right. this looks like an F to me. I don't yeah. think you can even conceive of building around it. Dark Tutelage is two and a black for an enchantment at Uncommon. And it says, at the beginning of your upkeep, reveal the top card of your library and put that card into your hand. You lose life equal to its mana value. All right. So hear me out. Bob? It's Dark Confidant on an enchantment, which mm -hmm. the upside of that is that it's harder for them to kill. The downside of that is that it doesn't attack or block, so it doesn't mm -hmm. naturally die mm -hmm. when you want it to die. Like mm -hmm. Bob has the thing where... They want it to stay in play to try to kill you, but if they attack you, you get to chump with it. Right. Dark Tutelage doesn't affect the board at all. It's just straight up, you know, you, you, a Bob effect every turn. I think if your deck can meet a couple different factors, you can actually play this card. Have a low overall curve, have mm -hmm. some ways to gain life, and have bargain cards. And okay. I had a deck that met all three, and it was actually good. I drew it a couple times, and each time I was happy to draw it. Okay. Like, it stayed in play for four or five turns, and I eventually bargained it away after getting a bunch of extra cards off it. So okay, that's a build around, like, C to me, where mm -hmm. it's not going to come together very often. But honestly, like, it can work. Also, imagine you're playing an aggro deck, and you sideboard it in against a control deck. Like mm -hmm. where they're yeah. not attacking your life total. It is a powerful card. It's it an is. extra card every turn. So okay, it it's, you know... It's a dangerous power, but it, it is one that can actually work. Uh, Necropotence is next. Black, black, black for an enchantment at Mythic. You skip your draw step. Whenever you discard a card, you exile that card from your graveyard. You can pay one life to exile the top card of your library face down. Put that card into your hand at the beginning of your next end step. So you basically get to pay a life to draw a card, but there's like a little delay on it. Uh -huh. And then you also don't draw for your turn. Right. So... Necro has a couple major problems. One is that it costs triple black. So yeah. it's it's hard to have a deck where you can cast this in a timely manner. The second is that you skip your draw step. So let's say you play Necro and you pay four life to draw four cards. Then you skip your draw step. Then you pay like three life to draw three cards. Then you skip your draw step. And then maybe you don't have life to pay and you're working through those cards. So you, for the next two turns, you don't use it. You're not actually up that many cards because you skip like four draw steps. Mm -hmm. So necro has like a pretty real cost to it that even if you drew a bunch of cards off it you're losing a card every turn it's in play right that being said if you were somehow like very very heavy black like we're talking 11 12 black sources nearly mono black and had bargain and life gain like it is powerful like, it is you this could is just one say, of the best magic cards six. of all time yeah <laughs> and then bargain it away like that could happen I think the mana cost is really going to be tough. You know, that, yeah, that's, that is the, that's the main thing. So hard. Yeah. Like how I, good would Necro be if it cost two and a black? Yeah, I think it, like you said, it would, it would fill a similar role to dark tutelage. It's like a way to gain a lot of card advantage if you can bargain it away so that it doesn't kill you or lock you out of the game. But it'd be a lot stronger because it you would, would pay be. like six life to draw six cards minus one per turn instead of paying like seven life to draw two cards or three cards because tutelage is, is, you know, sometimes you pay four life in a turn. Right. Uh, so I think Necro's an F basically. Yeah. But hey, you know, if you're nearly mono black, yeah, I would maybe try playing this card. Nearly mono black and have a lot of bargain. That's what you need. Yeah. Uh, oppression is next. It is one black black for an enchantment at rare. Whenever a player casts a spell, that player discards a card. That affects both of us? Yeah, it's yeah, enough. Forget that. Next is Stab Wound. Ooh, I like this one. This is two and a black for an enchantment aura. It's uncommon. It enchants a creature. The creature gets minus two, minus two. And at the beginning of the upkeep of the enchanted creature's controller, that player loses two life. 
So what you want to do with stab wound isn't kill their creature, though it's fine if you do that. Like if you need to kill their 2-2 flyer, just go ahead and do it. What you want to do is put it on like a 3-3 or ideally like a 2-4 or 2-3. And then just that creature sits there and play doing nothing now because it's smaller and losing them two life a turn. Like that is just awesome. If if you can if you can land a good stab wound, you can win the game really quickly because it's it's like a two powered haste creature that's like unblockable and, and very hard to kill. To kill it, yeah. they need to usually kill their own creature. And you get the squirm factor. It's it's really like boa constrictor like as your opponent's oh, yeah. like, what am I going to do? I uh, yeah. So I, I like B for stab wound. I like B plus. I think it's sure. it's, it's quite strong. Uh, Grave pact is next. It's one black 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 for an enchantment. Uh, it's mythic. It says, whenever a creature you control dies, each other player sacrifices a creature. So this one's really powerful. This is actually worth trying to stretch your mana if you can get there. Making all your creatures take something out with them is huge. And it's impossible to win a game against Grave Pact that involves a lot of creatures on both sides of the board. Right. Like, it just is that strong. Never so, been beaten. I would say it's like a builder on A, where like if you can basically get your deck to a point where you can play 12 swamps in it and play grave pact, then it is fantastic. But yeah. it, it, the, the, the casting cost is the hard part and you have to have a lot of creatures. So don't, don't forget that part. Uh, ley line of the void. So this is a black ley line. It's two black, black. If it's in your opening hand, you can start with it on the battlefield. And if a card would be put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere, you exile it instead. And unfortunately, once again, the, e even if the effect matters at, even a little bit, it's just not worth a card. So no, that's not play it. Uh, polluted bonds is three black black for an enchantment whenever a land enters the battlefield under an opponent's control that player loses two life and you gain two life it's just too late at that point for it to matter yeah i would say this is an f also i just I think don't think so. i don't think you can really put this card in your deck and hope for a good outcome no if they already have four or five mana they may play one or two extra lands so five mana to drain them for two or four is not worth it and it's their choice uh sanguine bond is our last black card on the bonus sheet, it is three black black for an enchantment at rare. Whenever you gain life, target opponent loses that much life. Yeah, can I, can I food I, token somebody out? Is I, I, I mean, compare this to Griffin Airy. It's five mana, and instead of getting a two two, you drain them for three. Mm -hmm. I would rather have the, the Griffin Airy by a lot, and I don't think that card's even that good. So, yeah. so no to Sanguine Bond. Although there's maybe something cool. All right, red. Uh, first card up is Dragon Mantle, which is red for an aura at uncommon. It a chance a creature. When it enters the battlefield, you draw a card. So right there, that's like, you don't need a whole lot more here. Enchanted creature has pay a red. This creature gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn, also known as Fire Breathing. Yeah, so it's like a minor effect, but a one mana aura that draws a card. I mean, it's really easy to justify playing this card. You should always play it in your, in your base red deck. So for that sure. makes it like a, a C to me. Yeah, same. Um, Goblin Bombardment. You mentioned this one before. One in a red enchantment at rare. You can sacrifice a creature, no mana costs involved, and this thing does one damage to any target. It's a build around B, but it really delivers rats to them. R rat <laughs> cannon? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you want to you play this with rats, of course, and you want to just try to accumulate as many as possible. The fact that it can hit creatures is so nice because it just means your rats start trading for their things and also just threaten their life total pretty nicely too. So yeah. uh, I like Builder on B for Goblin Bombardment. I Same. would not generally play this in a deck that couldn't make tokens because agreed. at straight up just sack a creature to deal one, that's just not a very good rate. No, but if you can make a bunch of rats who are expendable, I mean, you can just start jamming with everything and then just, yeah, okay, I've got five creatures, get you to five, kill you. Like th that happens a lot. Impact Tremors is one in a red for an enchantment. At Uncommon, it says, whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, Impact Tremors, deal, Tremors deals one damage to each opponent. So <sighs> this is another rat build around, but this one's a lot more dubious because it just goes straight to the face. That's mm -hmm. it. That's it. And you also have to cast this before you make all the rats, yep. not instead of after, which is another another pretty significant downside. So, so what's the number? <laughs> You know, if it did three, you're not happy. If it does four, you're probably still not happy. Maybe getting if there. It does, if it does four, I think. Like, you're can I at okay. least get a lava axe out of this thing? Or if it does five, I think you're pretty happy. And like, yeah. I mean, if you the thing is, if you play this on turn four, let's say, and then next turn make make a couple rats. Like you play this in turn four, play a two drop, then the turn after you make a couple rats. You're already kind of there. Like really, I, I think three damage. I mean, 
but the game's going to keep going, right? Yeah. So, well, you said you're already there. I mean, I, I'm saying I'm not there yet. <laughs> you know? Well, if I've done three damage in, in, in the first two turns it's in play, I assume that it's going to be good enough that game. Okay. Like you're going to play more that game. Yeah. But this looks like a build around like C. Yeah, like, at best. I, I believe that mo- most people who put this card in their deck should not. Yes. Like it will generally cause you to lose win rate. That isn't to say that every deck shouldn't play it. Yep. So this is one of those cards that – I bet we'll have a terrible win rate on 17 lands because most people shouldn't be playing it. It's not, there's no, there are decks that, that could play it though. Yeah. I, you know, a, a shortcut would be if this was a two, two for two, would it have performed better? And I think that on average it will by, by a fair bit, it would, a two, two for two would perform better. Uh, next is aggravated assault. This is two and a red for an enchantment and you can pay three red, red to uh, red, red to untap all creatures you control. If it's a main phase, there is an additional combat phase followed by an additional main phase. Activate only at sorcery speed. Uh, yeah, I think that's an F. Just yeah. in order for this to be good, you have to have this in play, have an attack that's good enough that you want to make another one, and spend five mana to do so. Like yeah. that's just not a real a realistic like combination of things it's a classic win more it also doesn't make it so that your attacks are better like it's not it's not your guys get first strike or something like that next is blood moon two and red for an enchantment non-basic lands or mountains that's that's just going to be an f i can't even really imagine a sideboard spot where you would it would be worth it to bring in a blood moon uh, in limited. Next is Mana Flare. This is two and a red for an enchantment. Whenever a player taps a land for mana, that player uh, adds one mana of any type that land produced. There's another F. You don't want to be the one to uh, <laughs> to pay for your opponent to pop off the next turn, which is exactly what happens when you play Mana Flare. Terrible card, yeah. Yeah, leave leave Mana Flare to Luis and Cube when he deems it I, necessary. I even barely play this card in and Cube And he now. <laughs> doesn't even pop up there. Uh, Ray Bombardment is two and a red for an enchantment and uncommon. Whenever a creature you control with power two or less attacks, Ray Bombardment deals one damage to the player or Planeswalker that creature is attacking. So this is basically like Impact Tremors, but instead of coming to play, it's you have to attack, which does get, offer the potential of getting multiple triggers per rat, right? Mm-hmm. If you have one rat that attacks three times, it deals three. Mm-hmm. I think it's effectively the same, uh, the kind of the same like uh, grade because yeah. If you want one, you probably want the other, and they're both going to work in kind of the same way. Mm-hmm. So I, I believe that uh, Raid Bombardment is like a build around C. You mostly shouldn't play it. The The difference, I guess, between this and the Rat deck is er, – and, and Impact Tremors is you. I could maybe see this in a deck that has a bunch of just cheap creatures that not, aren't just rats if you're getting multiple attacks. Like – I don't know. Is there like a blue red deck that has a bunch of little flyers and just attacks multiple times with this? Yeah. Any small evasive creatures actually make raid bombardment start to really add up, but that's a very specific niche. So I'm with you build around C or C minus next is repercussion. This is one red, red for an enchantment at mythic. Whenever a creature is dealt damage repercussion deals that much damage to its cre- to that creature's controller. Hmm. I've never seen this card. Yeah. It's a weird one. It, it's very close to creatures can't block. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I mean, Super it's, it's trampled to all your guys. Yeah. So basically like, I mean, the dream is they're at 10 and you cast this and attack with all your creatures and whether they block or not, they just take damage equal to your creature's power. The, the downside is if you're not winning, this card doesn't do anything. Yep. And yeah, I mean, even, even if like you play this attack trade off, they take a bunch of damage, but it doesn't, if they, you don't have a follow-up creature, this still doesn't do much for you. This this looks like an F to me. I don't I don't think and, this and is it hits good. you too. Oh yeah, it's it's symmetrical. That's an F. Uh, shared animosity is two and a red for an enchantment at rare. Whenever a creature you control attacks, it gets plus one plus zero until end of turn for each other attacking creature that shares a creature type with it. Ah, oh, this is so, in red though, because the the clear tribe is fairies from the set, right? Well, rats also rats. Are, are a big part of this. Like that's that's more okay. where I think this works. So like imagine if you have three rats in play, you're attacking for nine. Like it scales up really fast. That said, this is like the third. If you've got a bunch of rats, maybe you win the game enchantment. And this one at <laughs> least has like a pretty decent payoff because this one means your, your three rats can attack into their board of three threes and four fours and you feel good about it. Whereas Raid Bombardment doesn't do that. Impact Drummers doesn't do that. So – 
maybe this is like a builder on C plus and it's like a little bit better, but uh, honestly, I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't go too deep on any of these. They, I feel like they're not going to come up very often. Yeah. Same uh, ley line of lightning. So here's a red one, two red, red. You can uh, put it on the battlefield if you begin the game with it in your hand. And whenever you cast a spell, you may pay one. If you do, it does one damage target player or planeswalker. Yeah. If it, if it could hit creatures, we'd, do whole mm-hmm. different ball game. This is yeah. an F though because it can't. It's just an F. Sneak attack. Oh my god. Three and a red for an enchantment. Uh, it's mythic. You can pay red to put a creature card from your hand onto the battlefield. Creature gains haste and you sack it at the beginning of the next end step. As I powerful mean, as this is, in we love ourselves a sneak cube. attack. <laughs> yeah, but what are you putting in your five drop? <laughs> no, this card's terrible. Yeah. So no, can't play sneak attack. It's another F. And then the last card is fiery emancipation or the last red card. I should say is three red, red, red for an enchantment. If a source you control would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals triple that damage to that permanent or player instead. So your attacks against a player become tripled. If you, if your opponent blocks, it's almost assuredly a trade at the very least. Your burn spells triple up. This costs six six this mana. Costs six this, freaking mana. Yeah, I, I don't. I think this is an F. Also, like at least City on Fire had Convoke, and you could like yeah, you know, get get, get something going there. But this this is not going to do it. Could could this be a, a, an overrun? The problem is it doesn't make, it doesn't your, make your small your creatures, creatures big. Actually, get it? Well, it kind of does. I mean, it makes your one ones into three ones, and your two twos into six twos. But like, it doesn't give trample either, right? I think I think it's an F. I, I just okay. I don't I don't think you can uh They should have made it twenty times the damage. Yeah. Uh, I mean that wouldn't have changed too much, honestly. No. <laughs> <laughs> Your one one kills them. <laughs> All right. Uh green, last color here for a bonus mm-hmm. sheet. Hardened scales is first up. It's green for an enchantment. It's rare. If one or more plus and plus one counters would be put on a creature you control, that many plus one plus and plus one counters are put on it instead. Not really on theme in this set, right? No, it's not. This is more about auras. Yeah. Utopia Sprawl. Green enchantment aura uncommon. It enchants a forest. Now, it's notable. It's not a land. It enchants specifically a forest. As Utopia Sprawl enters the battlefield, you choose a color. And whenever the enchanted forest is tapped for mana, its controller adds an additional one mana of the chosen color. The fact that it's enchanted a chant forest matters not at all in limited because you can't cast it without forest pretty much. I guess you could draw like... The blue, green, or black, green <laughs> dual land or a crystal grotto, but sure. Yeah. In any case, this is a great card. I think it's actually being pretty underrated right now because mm. it's a weird enchanted uh, bonus sheet card or whatever. I don't know. Because Utopia Sprawl is a, an accelerant they can't kill that fixes any color. Like yeah. this card's a B. It's super and it's a one good. mana one. One of the first games of the format, I played turn one Utopia Sprawl, turn two Troyan, the blue-green one three, and then turn three six drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Utopia Sprawl's aw- I mean, we play this in cube, like, for the exact yeah. same reason that you're going to play it in this format. Like, no yeah. different. So, yeah. yeah, I really like that. And one mana fixing accelerants that are hard to kill, or you almost never see those in limited. So this is an opportunity to play one of these and uh, do something you can't really do in the format. So I like B for Utopia Sprawl as well. Ground Seal is one and a green for an enchantment. It's uncommon. When it ETBs, you draw a card, and cards in graveyards can't be the targets of spells or abilities. Basically, this is a, a cantrip enchantment for bargain. That's about it. Okay. You can just throw it. You can just get your card back and then sack it to bargain later on. Yeah. Which puts it in the C minus camp or something. Yeah. Um, Prismatic Omen. This is one and a green for uh, an enchantment. Lands you control are every basic land type in addition to their other types. But you don't get to, you don't get a card back. So that that just looks like an F to me. Like yeah, build, I don't build your mana base right. You know, because you can't build around it fully. Because the games where you don't draw it, then you, your deck's not functional. Next is Season of Growth. This is one and a green for an enchantment and uncommon. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control. Scry one. Whenever you cast a spell that targets a creature you control, draw a card. I really want to build around this card. I haven't, I haven't managed to do so yet. But so it, it counts does for combat like, tricks, but it doesn't for rolls, right? Since they're usually attached does, to other things. Well, 
if you cast the role adventure cards like the Besotted Knight or the Conceited Witch, that does count because you're casting a spell that targets a creature. Oh, okay. Then if man. you're casting an ETB, put a role on something, then no. Um, then no. But like, yeah, okay. for, this, this has a bunch of stuff that it works with, and I think there's some potential here, but I haven't managed to pull it together yet. Okay. So that that looks like a build around C to me, like one of those like mid, like kind of dubious build arounds that yeah. sometimes will work. I will say the two times my opponents have cast this against me, they have not. <laughs> utilized it well okay so, so it, really have to probably another, build pretty this strongly is going to be another it. one of those low win rate cards that sometimes work <laughs> which i honestly think make limited formats better i do too it's it's fine if cards aren't easy to use and people use them wrong most of the time that is totally totally that good. is totally fine it gives you something to dream for later in the format next is garrick's uprising this is two and a green for an enchantment at uncommon when it enters a battlefield if you control a creature with power four or greater draw a card Creatures you control have trample, just straight up, and whenever a creature with power four or greater enters a battlefield under your control, draw a card. Another I mean, heavy this build is, around. Yeah, basically a worse up to Beanstalk, I think. Mm, mm -hmm. I, I think it's just a little harder to use. But yeah, it's like a build around like B minus. Like you can you can you can imagine decks where it's decent, you know? Yeah, and it is easy to see. Uh, what those look like. Defense of the Heart is next. It's three and a green for an enchantment at Mythic. At the beginning of your upkeep, if an opponent controls three or more creatures, sacrifice Defense of the Heart. Search your library for up to two creature cards. Put those cards onto the battlefield and shuffle. Interesting card. S seems like it might actually work in this format. Like tokens are kind of, there's a lot of like random, you know, rats and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean... And what is your opponent going to do not... Like, even if you have this out and they have two creatures, they're like, ha-ha, I'm not going to play a third creature. Like, you can just keep casting stuff as you want. Yeah, I think that the, the, the key here is, can you get the board to a spot where they, they have three creatures and you're not dead? Because if that's the case, I think this card works fairly well. And I think you could. Yeah. I, the thing is, I don't see how they play around it. Right. Like this isn't like Oath of Druids or a, an effect where you, if you, or land tax where if you play creatures, they get to play creatures. You right. just get to play creatures and they, and they, 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 they still, if they don't play creatures, you kill them with yours. If they do play creatures, this triggers. Getting to three creatures isn't that hard. And I think that, uh, I think that getting, having them have three creatures in play is going to happen fairly often. This looks decent to me. Me too. I you wouldn't just go get anything you want. You yeah. just get your two best creatures. Directly into play. Like, <laughs> I I mean, I, I look, I, I could definitely see this maybe coming, like turning out to be not fantastic, but I, mm -hmm. it looks pretty good to me. I think that it's going to, I think it's going to be decent. I, I, would I would say definitely it's like, like, a, it. like a B or something like that. Me too. I think so too. I, I just can't imagine a world where they can kill you with only two creatures. So even if you just run this out into an empty board that it, I just don't really see how it leaves your opponent that many great options. Sure, they can keep them, they can keep from triggering it, but how are they going to beat you? Yeah. I like it. Uh, Leyline of Abundance is next. This is the green one. It's two GG. Again, if it's in your opening hand, you can start with it on the battlefield. Whenever you tap a creature for mana, add an additional green, and you can pay six green green. That's right, six green green to put a plus one plus one counter on each creature yeah. you control. Uh, F. It's just, it's yeah, just not good. Yeah, man, it's just too expensive. And and you don't have enough creatures necessarily that tap for mana. Uh, Nature's Will is also two green green. This is an enchantment that says it's rare. Whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, tap all lands that player controls and untap all lands you control. No. No. Uh, Come on. This one might be interesting. Parallel Lives, three and a green, enchantment at Mythic. If an effect would create one or more tokens under your control, it can creates twice that many tokens instead. Can I make this I, happen? I don't think so. Okay. Like this is not costs, a. It mm -hmm. costs four mana, and you have to like play it before you make the tokens. And making Ugh. double food isn't even that good. Making double rats is not like amazing, and it's green. So I'm going to shortcut a little because there's parallel lives. <laughs> There's doubling season. Yeah. And there's primal vigor and they all double tokens. Okay. And in fact, primal vigor even doubles the tokens your opponent makes. So oh, <laughs> let's, let's, but, let's but just wait, call, you can pay more for that if you want. <laughs> yeah. <It's> five. <laughs> let's just let's just call all of them an F okay. and move on with our lives. The last card in the set 
unnatural growth, one green, 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 four green mana, so five mana total. Enchantment at the beginning of combat, double the power and toughness of each creature you control until end of turn. So this is basically a build around B with the B being, are you mono green? Like Mm -hmm. if you're literally mono green, then this card just costs five mana and you're not, it's not that hard to, to do. If you're not mono green, you can basically never cast it, and you're going to end up in a really, really bad position whenever you draw it because it'll just sit in your hand. So I think that if you're going to be mono green, this is actually a strong card. Effectively doubling all the stats of your creatures is worth five mana. I would pay a five colorless card that does that. So if you end up in mono green some of the time, then yeah, this card can do it. But most of the time, this is just not going to be a card you can just fathom putting in your deck. What what set was it from? Innistrad this or was, something? This is one of the Midnight Hunt set, I think. Yeah. It, it, I remember this seeing this on the battlefield, and I was like, oh, like it also triggers on, you know, the other turn, and it, it ends up dominating. But yeah, it's just really hard to cast, so you have to know if you can do that or not. Okay, that's it, Luis. We did it. We made it through bonus sheet and all. That bonus sheet really does add a lot of extra cards, but I feel pretty comfortable kind of picking and choosing which ones we talk about because some so many of them are kind of... I don't know, they're for constructed or to get them on arena or whatever other motivations they have to put these things in here. Um, totally. Let's call it a show there. Um, if you want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. You can find everything related to the show at uh, LRcast.com, including links to Luis's YouTube channel and his Twitch stream right on the front there. If you want to get caught up, he's been putting up some videos for Wilds of Eldrain so you can get an idea for how he's approaching the format. Uh, and of course the, uh, awesome vintage cube videos that he's been doing for a while are there as well. Um, you can, uh, you can find every episode of the show. You can listen to the set review of the commons and uncommons for this set that we put out last week on there, uh, or on the YouTube channel. And, uh, of course you can find all the old episodes of the show there as well. We want to thank squirrel loot once again for coming on on short notice to help us uh, do production on the show and, uh, our patrons as well for supporting us. We thank you very, very much. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. We'll see you next week. All right, quick primer on the deck. I've been drafting a bunch. And, you know, the format's still developing. We'll see where it lands. But I've been liking uh, kind of like five-color blue, which basically looks like this. It's main blue plus another color, mostly red, because red, I think, is the best secondary color for it. And what you're trying to do is combine Torch the Tower as the best card. I actually posted a screenshot where I had four in my hand because that was a deck that was five of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, Blue Interaction, it like counter spells like Spell Stutter, Ice Out, Disdainful Stroke. All those are great. Blue Card Draw, like Quick Study, and then Card Quality, like Sleight of Hand. And then Bargain Stuff because you're running ideally a couple Prophetic Prisms, um, You've got Spreading Seas. And then you're using Crystal Grotto and Prophetic Prism and Evolving Wilds to splash basically anything you want, but mostly off-color adventure cards. Cards like uh, the, the 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 Click that has Thread, the, the you know, Tear the Seams, Two and a White, Destroy Target Tap Creature, or a Gingerbread Hunter, the Giant, that gives minus two, minus two, and is a 5-5, five, five, or a- anything like that. And because a lot of the adventure cards are single-color what you can do is just one prism lets you splash a bunch of different adventure cards if you have it in play. And you can usually pick up, at least for now, like two prisms most draft and a third if you really want them. But you don't even have to go super hard because between prism, uh, crystal grotto, <clears throat> and evolving wilds, it's not hard to have like three to six ways to get mana of any color. And then once you do, it's just you play a, a mana base of like seven islands seven mountains and evolving wilds and like a plains and a swamp and then splash a couple off color adventure cards off those the evolving wilds the plains the swamp and two prisms for example or maybe replace one of the mountains with a crystal grotto or maybe you have an extra prism also uh the scarecrow that the two mana two one that filters your mana also works that card's also fine you can sack it to bargain it's a two one reach and uh it helps fix your mana and you basically just draw cards counter spells and kill their stuff with removal and it's been pretty good. Collector's Vault is also nice. The two-mana artifact, two-tap, draw a card, discard a card, make a treasure. Mm. There's basically a lot of ways to get five colors of mana and a lot of powerful cards to splash. So, so far, I've liked this this strategy. I'm going to continue drafting and kind of have a full more full report next week. But, you know, 
keep an eye on it. I, I did a stream where I drafted this deck and I actually ended up getting seven wins with the deck in the end, uh, even though the stream, you know, ended, at, I think I was like three, two or something. But uh, it's a strategy that's worked for me so far. And I wanted to give you a heads up that it's been pretty cool.